Hello Unity developers and welcome to today's video where we're going to be creating this fun little zombie simulation game developed using Unity's Experimental Entities 1.0 which is part of their data oriented technology stack or DOTS. So in today's video I'm going to be teaching you the fundamental concepts of Unity's data oriented technology stack and their entity component system. So this is going to be a really great jumping in point if you're brand new to Unity's DOTS and ECS or if you've used it in the past but it's been kind of a little bit of a while and you're ready to get back into it now that 1.0 is out in the wild. Now now at the time of recording, Experimental Entities 1.0 is still hot off the press, so it is a little bit buggy, so definitely user beware on that one. But I'm going to be showing you how to create this simple little si simulation where you shouldn't have too many issues with crashes because we're not doing anything too crazy or complex. Basically, we just have this little simulation where we have some zombies that rise up from the grave. From there, they're going to start walking towards this big brain conveniently placed at the center of the map. And then hordes of zombies are just going to keep spawning in until they eat that brain all the way down to nothing. So why are they doing this exactly? Well, because it's October and I thought it'd be kind of fun. Anyways, if you do find today's video fun and helpful and enjoyable and you learn some things about Unity's DOTS and ECS, I would really, really appreciate it if you share this out with anyone who may find it valuable, maybe some friends or some coworkers, or even just some people on some Discord servers or forums that you may frequent. I really do think that this video is going to be a great jumping in point to Unity's entity component system, and it's going to give people a lot of knowledge about kind of the fundamental concepts about, you know, how this all works. And then it's going to also serve as a good baseline for, you know, things to come. So after this, we can start getting into, you know, more fun and complex things. Now that we have everyone all cut up to speed on kind of the theory and how to do the basics in Unity's ECS. And if there's any particular thing that you'd like to see me do with Unity's dots in ECS, definitely let me know down in the comment section below. And if you're still a little bit uncertain about some of these terms like dots and ECS and, you know, what exactly all that means, we are going to be getting into all that, but first I do just want to mention some of the prerequisites just so you can make sure that you have, you know, the correct version of Unity and everything like that downloaded before moving on. So I will just reiterate the fact that I'm going to be showcasing an experimental version of Entities 1.0. So this is definitely not recommended for production ready use at this time. It is just a good way that we can kind of get our hands on the API, figure out how to do things, you know, as they work towards a more stable release, which should be happening sometime next year. So the version of the entities packages that I'm going to be using is compatible with the Unity 2022.2.0 beta number eight and above. I'm going to be showcasing uh, beta number 11 in this video because there are some bug fixes in that particular version. Version. So I would recommend that you're using the same or newer version that I am. I would highly recommend going ahead and checking out the Unity documentation because they're going to tell you the specific version that you should be using for, you know, whichever version of entities is out when you may be coming across this video. Also, you need to make sure that you're using an IDE that supports source generation. So you can use Visual Studio version 2022 and up or JetBrains Writer version 2021.3.3 and up. In this video, I'm going to be using JetBrains Writer version 2022. something or other. Really just the key is that your IDE supports source generation because Unity's data or technology stack heavily relies on source generation. And in fact, it's really nice because, you know, we can write, you know, pretty clean and readable code. And then on the back end, Unity does a lot of stuff with source generation to make much more efficient code that might be a little bit more cumbersome for us to write manually. I would also recommend that you have at least an intermediate understanding of Unity and C Sharp before following along in this video, because while this is going to be an introduction to Unity's DOTS and ECS, this isn't going to be an introduction to Unity and C Sharp in general. So there are kind of a number of things that I would consider more or less, you know, general Unity and C Sharp knowledge that I'm not going to be going like super into detail on just because it's not really the point of this video to do that. It's also important to note that DOTS and ECS are not necessarily beginner friendly concepts. They definitely are geared more towards the people who are experienced Unity developers who are starting to run into some limitations with the Unity game engine and just need those extra boosts of performance. And trust me, you can really get some extra boosts of performance. And kind of along those lines with this video, I really do just want to give you a working knowledge of Unity's DOTS and ECS so you can kind of go out on your own and start playing around building little games and simulations and things like that. So I'm really just going to be focusing on, you know, how everything works, not necessarily going 
too deep into the theory, although in a lot of my previous videos, I have gone much more into depth on the theory of those things. So I will be linking off to many videos along the way. You'll see me just kind of slide in a title and thumbnail over at the top here of a video that may give you a little bit more information on you know, some of the specifics of a particular concept if you wanna learn more about it. Just note that that video was most likely made with an older version of ECS. So there are going to be some things with the API that are outdated, but in general, the core concepts are going to be the same. Then there are also going to be a number of things which are brand new features to ECS 1.0, which I just haven't had the ability to create new videos on those but definitely be aware that those are gonna be coming, so stay tuned for those. Of course, if there are any particular topics that you'd like me to cover, feel free to leave those down in the comment section below. And then finally, I will just mention that I'm going to be including the starter and final project files associated with this video using the links down in the description below. If you use the starter projects, that's gonna be you know the best way to just make sure everything is set up exactly as you need it, because it's already going to have you know all the entities, packages, and everything built right in. And I've also created some models and art assets for this video, so those those will all be included with the starter project files, but feel free to use your own if you'd like. Okay, so now I'm gonna go a little bit into the theory about dots and ECS and talk about some of the terminologies of everything. If you are already pretty confident and familiar with Unity's dots and ECS, and you do just wanna to get to the tutorial section where we you know, start getting into the ECS 1.0 new APIs, feel free to skip ahead. There's probably gonna be nothing new in here for you. But again, I do just want to make sure that everyone who is watching this video, we're kind of you know all on the same page. We understand you know why we're using dots and ECS and kind of how it works behind the scenes, because it's really just gonna give you a better understanding about you know the concept as a whole. And it will help you make decisions as you start developing out your projects further so we'll just start you know completely high level even outside of unity and everything like that we'll talk about the difference between object oriented programming and data oriented design so i'm sure many of you are already familiar with object oriented programming because that's typically what we do in unity so oftentimes we'll create class files and these class files will be representative of a specific object and these specific objects can have different properties about them as well as functions on them to you know basically do things in the game so, you know, maybe one example of this is we have like a car controller and this car controller has some particular properties about, you know, it's top speed, acceleration rate, turning radius, you know, all specific things about the car. And then furthermore, we'll have functions about, you know, how it drives, you know, when it drives forward, how does that happen when we turn, you know, how do we start, you know, taking in all these properties into account to actually make the vehicle turn. And object-oriented programming is really great because it's very understandable to us humans. You know, it's just kind of the same way that we think about the world. You know, if we think about a car in real life, you know, this car has specific properties associated with it and those specific properties, you know, determine how the functions kind of react, you know, how the, how the car reacts. So object-oriented programming is very much aligned with how we humans interact with the world. And there's all sorts of cool things that we can do with object-oriented programming like polymorphism and inheritance so that we can have, you know, some objects inherit from a base class and then some of those base properties and methods will be available to that particular child object. Um, again, this is just really easy for us humans to understand and interpret. Data-oriented design, on the other hand, is going to be optimized much more towards how the computer naturally stores and processes data. And this is where a lot of the efficiency comes from. So rather than having, you know, all the properties and functions kind of all associated with one object, we actually kind of separate everything out. So that's where you hear about, you know, terms like the entity component system that's representative of a separation between entities, components, and systems. Really the key here is we're just separating our data away from the logic. Now the data is kind of, you know, standalone and we can kind of associate multiple types of data with one particular entity, which is kind of the equivalent of an object. And then, you know, completely separate from those things, we'll have systems and these systems will just operate on the data. And when these systems operate on data, that's how things actually happen in our game. You know, when values are changing, we can get things to kind of move around and change colors and do, you know, all sorts of normal things that we'd expect in any video game. And really some of the keys to the efficiency of data or into design is like data, it's all gonna be stored contiguously in RAM mostly. Um, so basically, instead of an object-oriented programming where things are kind of, you know, all scattered around in different places in RAM, and we're going to be having to, you know, reference all different places, that's going to be a bit of an inefficiency because, you know, every time we go to RAM, that's going to slow things down a little bit. Now, when a CPU processes data, 
what it's going to do is it's going to go out to RAM and it's going to grab that bit of data and it's going to do an operation on it and it's going to return it to RAM. However, it's not actually quite that simple because CPUs also have a bit of cache. Now, computers are kind of built around the fact that they know when they're going to be grabbing one bit of data, they're most likely going to be grabbing some other bits of data in that same kind of area. So what it does when it grabs in that kind of initial bit of data is it's going to pull in the data after that so then we can very easily process that data that's right next to it. So as you can tell, this is really an efficiency gain for data-oriented design because if we have you know, large groups of data that we're operating across and then we're already pulling in that data into the CPU cache naturally, that's going to be a much more efficient process because we can just pull in that data from the cache, which is known as a cache hit, rather than going out to the RAM memory to pull in that data, which is known as a cache miss. So that's where a lot of the efficiency gains of data-oriented design come into play, but there's also a lot of really cool things that you can do with data-oriented design. So for example, because we have systems that operate across large groups of data, well, what we can actually do is we can associate different data component types with different entities in order to change the behavior, because basically we're gonna be getting into this a little bit later, but when we have systems that say, you know, I want to operate across, you know, all entities that have these specific types of data components, well, we can go to our entities and we can say, you know, add or remove data components to change the functionality of, you know, what that entity is actually doing. And if you've been using Unity for a little while, you know that Unity is already kind of like a half step towards this particular part of data oriented design. You see that it kind of has like an object component model because we have game objects and we can associate components with them. And when we, you know, add or remove components, we're essentially adding and removing functionality. So now kind of getting into a little bit more of the Unity specifics theory. So what exactly is DOTS? So DOTS stands for Data Oriented Technology Stack. And this is basically a term that Unity coined, which is really just a collection of packages that are built around data oriented design. So the main one that we're gonna be focusing on is ECS or the Entity Component System. But also under that, there are things like the Job System, the Burst Compiler, the new Unity Math Library, the collections package and finally entities graphics which is previously known as the hybrid renderer and so basically we're going to be using all these packages here today in order to build out this fun little zombie simulation game so let's kind of dive into these packages a little bit more so the main one again is ECS the entity component system like I mentioned earlier, this is really talking about a separation of entities, components, and systems. Now we can kind of go into each of these things a little bit here. So we'll start off with entities. So an entity isn't really anything. Basically, all that an entity actually is, is it's just an index and a version number. And these index and version numbers are basically just a way that we can uniquely identify an entity um, inside of our game. And really the purpose of entities is just to group data component types together. So if we have, say, you know, one entity, which is going to represent, you know, one thing in our game, that entity will have, you know, multiple data components associated with it. And I should mention that every unique combination of data components that form an entity is known as an archetype. So next up are components and components are the actual data that's going to be associated with these entities. And this data can be pretty much anything. Of course, it can be static data like move speed or attack strength, but it can also be dynamic data. Maybe we have, you know, hit points or you know, current speed, but it's really just the actual data associated with these entities. Now the data components are going to be stored in chunks. Now chunks are 16 kilobyte blocks of memory that are going to be blocked off inside of the RAM. And so this is where all the actual data associated with entities are going to be living. Now the thing to note about chunks is that in each chunk, you're only going to have data associated with one particular archetype. So you see that in our game, we're going to be having, you know, a bunch of zombies and then one kind of brain in the middle. So all those zombies, they're all going to be in chunks that have that zombie archetype, but then we're also going to have a separate chunk, which is going to have just that one single brain in it. Now, because we're going to have a very large number of zombies, you know, over time, we're going to be allocating a significant number of chunks inside of our game for all those zombies. However, throughout the duration of the game, we only have one brain, so we're only going to have one chunk for that brain. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that one single brain, we're not gonna have 16 kilobytes of data associated with it. So there is going to be a little bit of, you know, air quotes, wo wasted space because that whole 16 kilobyte block of memory is still going to be blocked off in RAM, even though we're only going to be using a fraction of that. So that is kind of one thing to keep in mind. You know, maybe if you have a very high number of archetypes and a low entity count per archetype, 
you probably are going to end up with a little bit of wasted memory in that case. So next up would be systems. Now systems, again, are the things that actually operate on this data to make things happen inside of our game. Now, the important thing about systems is we're going to be running these systems across groups of entities. Now, the way we actually get a group of entities is by doing something known as an entity query. Now, we're going to be able to create these entity queries in multiple different ways. However, basically the gist of it is that we say, you know, I want to get a collection of all the entities that have these specific types of data components. And we can even get a little bit more complex with them and say, you know, I want all the entities that have these data components, but do not have these data components. So we can get, you know, very specific with it. And it's really important to understand these entity queries and how they work because, you know, we can make an entity query and we can actually return multiple different archetypes of entities. Maybe that's something that we want, or maybe that's something that we don't want. So basically what that means is maybe we create a system and then it starts operating across entities that we don't actually want that system to be affected by. Now with systems, we always want to treat it as if we're, you know, operating across a group of entities you know sometimes our system is only going to be operating across one single entity but we still want to structure our code in such a way that it's you know as if we're operating across a group of entities now another important thing about systems is the actual order that these systems are played in this is really important because when we start getting into more complex things like multi-threading and you know scheduling jobs on worker threads which I will be talking about in just a second you know we're gonna run into some situations where we have you know one bit of data that's going to be right writing to a component and then one bit of data that's going to be reading from that component. So it's really important that we understand, you know, how we're ordering our systems to, you know, most efficiently access that data and make sure that it has the, you know, correctly updated data depending on, you know, when we want to update it. So there are a number of ways that we can kind of manually order these systems so that we have, you know, one system operate before another system, or we can also group things together. So we can say, you know, I'm going to put all these systems into a particular group, and this group is going to, you know, operate before or after this particular system. Now there's already going to be a couple of built-in groups. So there's kind of the initialization system group. And in the initialization system group, this is kind of where all the initialization stuff happens. We're not going to be doing too much in there. Most of the stuff is going to happen in the second group, which is the simulation system group. So this is kind of where most of our game logic is going to be taking place. And then finally, there's the presentation system group. And this is, you know, actually where things start um, being rendered and all that. And then all these systems and entities that we're talking about, these are all going to be associated with a particular world. In this case, we're just going to be using the default world. But there are some instances that we can create multiple worlds if we like. And this is really nice for doing things like multiplayer games and all that. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk a little bit about the job system. So the job system is a really convenient way for us to schedule work across multiple threads. So basically what this means is that, you know, modern CPUs these days, these are often going to have a number of cores. And depending on how the CPU was manufactured, a core can have either one or two threads associated with it. Now, each of these threads are going to operate on data completely independent of each other. So basically what that means is that when one thread is operating on some group of data, another thread is not going to be able to see that, you know, updated data until it has been synchronized back with the main thread. Basically, the way that the job system works is we're going to have one thread that's kind of designated as the main thread, and that's going to be, you know, running most of the code in our game, and that's going to be in charge of scheduling out jobs. Now, when we have jobs, this is basically going to be, you know, we create some bit of work that can run across different threads other than the main thread, which are known as worker threads. Now, when we schedule out a job, we're basically going to, you know, put that bit of work into a job queue and the worker threads, whenever they're available, they're just going to pull in that work and then operate across it. Now, Unity takes care of a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So it's going to, you know, take care of scheduling the work across multiple threads. You know, it doesn't matter how many threads are on our system. And it's also going to do some automatic dependency management so that, you know, again, we don't run into some weird situations where we're, say, you know, writing to one bit of data and then later we're going to be reading from that bit of data. And we can kind of end up in this weird situation known as a race condition where it could potentially be inconsistent, whether we're, you know, reading from that data before that it had actually been written to or after it. And so there are three types of ways that we can actually schedule a job. The first is run and run will just go ahead and run that right there and then on the main thread. This is going to be the easiest to implement because you don't need to worry about any dependency management or anything like that because it's just going to you know do the operation right away. And if we're going to be doing some particular 
particular work against a small number of entities doing some you know very simple work most often it's actually going to be best to just go ahead and run that operation on the main thread because there's going to be a little bit of overhead with actually scheduling jobs so then the next one is schedule and schedule is basically when we say take some bit of work and then we go ahead and schedule that off onto a worker thread now the thing about schedule is it's only going to run on one worker thread whereas the other option schedule parallel that's going to be able to run work across multiple worker threads you know in parallel with other jobs so ideally we want to use schedule parallel if for some reason we can't use schedule parallel schedule works pretty well because we can still you know have that uh, automatic dependency management and we don't need to you know, necessarily run work right away and again there are some inefficiencies but i won't be going into all that right now and then finally run is when we want to run something on the main thread. The next package I'll be talking about is the Burst compiler. Now the Burst compiler is actually going to be the source of many, many of our performance games. And you can even try this out for yourself when we're going through developing the project. You know, go ahead and turn the Burst compiler on and off and do some performance comparisons between the two. Um, it's pretty impressive about you know how much more efficient it is with the Burst compiler on. Now the Burst compiler kind of does a lot of behind the scenes magic. It does you know a lot of optimizations, especially especially SIMD type optimizations, which stands for single instruction, multiple data, where it basically takes in, you know, multiple data components that are all kind of the same, you know, combines those all into one single CPU instruction. So we just end up getting massive gains in performance. Now there are a number of limitations with the burst compiler. Notably, we can only use blittable non-managed data types. So that basically means, you know, we can only use simple data types like, you know, integers, floating point numbers, booleans, or or custom structs that we create, you know, using only these simple data types. It's not going to work with any managed data types like classes and a lot of the, you know, kind of traditional components built into Unity. Uh, the Burst compiler is a very complex topic that goes very, very deep. But in general, you know, if you kind of follow these simple rules, you can really take advantage of the performance gains of the Burst compiler. Next up would be the new Unity Mathematics package. And this is basically, you know, a math library that we can use with the data components that we're going to be creating in our game and again all this stuff is you know very efficient and compatible with the burst compiler so that's kind of the reason why there's a separate math library next up is the collections package and this basically allows us to use things like native arrays and native lists basically these are really efficient types of collections which are fully compatible with the burst compiler and then finally there's the entities graphics package which was previously known as the hybrid renderer basically the purpose of this package is to actually render entities in our game so of course we're going to be having you know visual things happen inside of our game so of course we are going to want the um, entities graphics package one thing to note about the entities graphics package is it's only compatible with the universal render pipeline and the high definition render pipeline so you cannot use the built-in unity render pipeline okay so now's the time to actually develop out the project so you see that i am over in the unity hub here you see that i'm developing a new project again using the correct unity version in this case i'm using the 2022.2.0 beta 11 and make sure you select that from the drop down because it probably won't be selected by default. Um, now going on to the templates, we're going to use the 3D URP templates. And if you haven't used this before, you'll go ahead and need to download the template package. It literally takes half a second to do it. And then just go ahead and set up your project settings to give it a fun name like a zombie brains project and go ahead and save it to your regular Unity project files location. So go ahead and create the project and let Unity do its thing. Okay, so once Unity's opened up, the first thing that we're gonna do is just go ahead and click this remove readme assets here from the uh, URP template because we don't need uh, any of that stuff really. So this will just take a second here. Next thing that we're gonna do is just go up to window and package manager and then the package manager window will open up here. Now here's where we actually need to go ahead and add in the entities packages. So actually you won't find these in the Unity registry here because these are still technically experimental preview packages. So what we'll have to do is add them manually. So we'll go ahead and click this plus button and then we'll go ahead and say add package by name. So when we do this, you'll see that we have this little window here where it asks us to type in the name of the package and optionally we can type in the version of the package. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add the entities graphics package first. So we'll do that by doing com dot unity dot entities dot graphics so i'm going to go ahead and click add here and you'll see that it's going to start installing the graphics package now the reason that we do the graphics package first is basically um, it's based on the way that the package dependencies work so the entities graphics package 
that has a dependency on the regular entities package. The regular entities package has a pack has a dependency on a bunch of other packages. So basically just by installing this entities graphics package, it's going to install most of what we need already. Okay. So once that finished up, you'll see that we now do have the entities package and we also do have the entities graphics package. You see that it has this little chain link here, which means that it is installed as a dependency. And also we can go ahead and check in the dependencies and you'll see that it's using, you know, the burst collections, mathematics, job system, and all this stuff here. And I should just point out in this video i'm going to be using the 1.1.0 experimental 8 version and if you do want to create your own meshes inside of unity like i did you can install pro builder i'm just going to go ahead and do this right now in case i need any tools but i don't think i should okay after that i'm just going to go ahead and close out of the package manager here i'm going to go up to this layout and set this custom layout that i have here uh, by the way i will include this custom layout with the project files for this video so if you do want you can go up here and you can do a load layout from file and navigate to that layout file, which is part of the project files associated with this video. Okay, so let me just give you a quick little tour of this layout here. So you see that in the upper left, I have the scene view. Down below that, I have the game view. And then next to that, I have the regular hierarchy window. I'm sure if you've used Unity, you are very familiar with how all these windows work. However, you'll notice that we do have this other window, which is the entities hierarchy. Now this is a special one. And actually we can get to all these special ECS ones just by going up to window and then down to entities. You'll see that there's the hierarchy, components, systems, archetypes, and journaling. Now we won't be using all of these windows today, um, but a couple, do want, a couple ones that I do want to point out would be the entities hierarchy window. So basically when we go ahead and play our game, it's actually going to show up with all the entities that are inside the game here. And these would basically be any game objects that are sitting in sub scenes that essentially get converted over into ECS entities. Now down below that, we have a couple different windows here. So we have the console, again, just a regular Unity console. Next up are the archetype and component windows. Um, we're not really going to be using these all that much in this video. However, I will be showcasing the systems window in just a few places because it is helpful for us to get an idea about you know where our systems are actually being ordered against other systems and it's going to give us some debug information about you know how many entities are running in a particular system and how long that system is taking so we can you know kind of start getting some performance metrics so the systems window is very helpful for debugging of course next up over here i do just have the project window again just the regular standard unity project window and then here i have the inspector of course when we click on a game object it's just going to going to go ahead and show all of its components in there however you see that up at the top here there's this little circle icon and with this we can actually toggle between the runtime and authoring modes and then the runtime mode when we have an entity selected it's going to show us all the ECS data components in here so again very helpful stuff there all right so now I'm going to go over to my project settings and there are a couple things that we want to set up first under the editor tab we're just going to scroll all the way down towards the bottom and you'll see that these are the enter play mode settings if you go ahead and check mark the option for enter play mode options, then that's basically going to enable the fast enter play mode settings. Then you just want to leave these other two boxes unchecked. It is going to skip a couple of the reloading steps so you can enter play mode much more quickly. However, there are some limitations to that. I'll leave some more documentation in the links in the description below. If you're doing a little bit more information on that. Okay, next up graphics. We just want to make sure our URP asset is set in here, which it should be by default when you open up that template. Next up, we'll go to player and then under other settings and rendering, make sure color space is set to linear. And one thing that we absolutely need to make sure that we do is go up to jobs and burst and check mark the box next to enable compilation. So that is going to enable the burst compiler so we get the highest performance out of our game. Now, if you do want to experiment with this a little bit, feel free to go ahead and turn this off and on so you can get a performance comparison between when burst is on and off. Okay, so I just went ahead and imported some of my art assets here. Feel free to make this however you want it to, but basically all you really need is is this plane on the floor here just so we kind of have some ground to you know spawn things on top of now the first thing that we're going to do is go ahead and create a sub scene now a sub scene is basically an asset just kind of that um, sits in our regular scene here but it's actually a scene assets now there are a lot of you know crazy cool things that you can do with sub scenes i'm sure i'll be going into these more in depth later on 
but basically we need to use subscenes because any game object that we put in one of these subscenes it's going to be converted over to an entity. Now, this is a little bit different than the conversion workflow that I have showcased previously on my channel, where we put like a convert to entity component on a regular game object and just convert it in the normal scene. Unfortunately, that workflow is no longer, so we have to basically make everything through subscenes. So basically, the way that we're gonna do this is we'll go ahead and right click on our main graveyard scene right here. We're gonna go ahead and say new empty subscene. It's gonna go ahead and pop up with a window and we can call this the graveyard entity scene. So you see that now we do have this kind of like separate scene here under our main graveyard scene. Now you see that there's a check mark here next to this graveyard entity scene. That basically just means that the subscene is open. So now let's go ahead and start adding some entities into it. So we'll do a right click and we'll go ahead and um, just go ahead and create an empty game object here. And then this will be our brain. So we'll have our brain right at the center of the map here. We'll just leave it at the uh, you know default 000. zero, zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter play mode, of course, because this is an empty entity. We don't expect you know anything actually to appear in the scene here. You see that the brain is still showing up here in the hierarchy under this graveyard entity scene here. And now if we do go over to the entities hierarchy, you see that these basically list out all the entities inside of the scene. So you'll see that again under this graveyard entity scene, we do see this brain entity right here. Now, if we click on this, we can kind of come over to the inspector and you see that the inspector looks a little bit different. Now, this is kind of the entity type inspector. So you see under this tab right here, these are the components. So these are all the components that are associated with a particular entity. So in this case, you'll see that this brain has a local to world transform and a local to world component. This basically tells the game engine, you know, where this entity lives in the world and it gives it some information about, you know, where it should be rendered based off of that. Now you'll see here, there's this kind of like orange little circle icon if we actually click on this you'll see that now this actually reverts to um, what is known as kind of the baking workflow so this is basically you know looks a lot similar to when it was a game object previously we can go ahead and modify these values you'll see that you know our little transform is kind of moving around in the scene right there as we do that and then again, if we go ahead and click on this, this is now actually in kind of like a hybrid mode right here where there's kind of a little orange circle inside of the larger one. And this is kind of a little bit of a hybrid mode. Typically, I just use either, you know, one or the other. So this is kind of the uh, actual entity one. And you'll see that now that this value has been updated because we changed that value over on the um, baking side. Okay, so now let's go ahead and exit out of play mode and let's go ahead and make it so we can actually see this brain. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a mesh filter component here and we'll go ahead and put the brain mesh on there and then we'll go ahead and add a mesh renderer as well you see that the mesh is basically just a rather large sphere here that's just kind of halfway down into the ground uh, for the material of course we're just going to go ahead and use the brain material here and that is all that we should need let me try and close this sub scene okay so i just needed to close the sub scene for it to uh, refresh here so anyways you'll see that we now have this brain which is basically just this sphere with this cool brain material on it so let's go ahead and enter play mode you'll see that you know basically nothing changes we still see a brain kind of in our scene here cool thing about unity entities 1.0 is we can now actually click on the brain in the scene it does select it in the inspector which is a very awesome stuff and then we can kind of click this little toggle here to go over to our um, you know actual entity components so if we look in here you see that now there are quite a few more components basically just when we added that mesh and that renderer it has you know quite a number of other components here so just be aware you know if you are rendering entities there are going to be a number of extra components put on your entities. Okay, so that's not all too interesting. So we'll go ahead and exit out of play mode here. And then also I just wanna show you with these sub scenes, if we go ahead and close this graveyard entity scene here and then do an unload operation, you'll see that that's when it actually disappears um, from the scene view here. However, if we go ahead and enter play mode, you'll see that the sub scene just loads right back in. Anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and close out of here and I'm gonna go ahead and unload the entity scene here just so that's kind of out of the way for now because I'm gonna go ahead and create a new empty game object. This is just in the regular graveyard scene here and I'm gonna call this tombstone. So now we're gonna go ahead and actually start spawning some tombstones all over this graveyard. So this tombstone is just at zero, zero, zero. Now we don't actually wanna have anything on this base uh, tombstone here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and create a child game object here, and this will be the renderer. And then same thing as kind of for the brain, we're gonna go ahead and add a mesh filter 
for the mesh, I'm gonna use the tombstone mesh. And then when we go ahead onto the mesh renderer, go ahead and add the uh, tombstone material here. So then now you'll see that the mesh isn't exactly positioned as we want it. So just on the renderer, we're gonna go ahead and set this to one and 90. And then so that will basically put the uh, tombstone just kind of right above the ground like that. And then so now we have kind of our, our base little tombstone here. And so of course, because we wanna spawn these tombstones basically all throughout our world, I'm gonna go ahead and create a prefab out of it. So you see that I have this prefabs folder. I'm just gonna go ahead and drag this tombstone right into there. And then we can just delete the tombstone right out of the scene here. So now you'll see that we basically just have this regular tombstone prefab. Again, if we double click on this, you'll see that it opens up kind of in the little prefab editor which has the renderer component under it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and reload the graveyard entity scene here. And then in here, we're just gonna go ahead and create a new empty game object here. We can call this one graveyard. And this graveyard entity is basically going to be in charge of a lot of the graveyard properties. So it's going to basically spawn all the tombstones and then when we actually get to the point where we're to spawn zombies it's going to be taking care of that as well okay so at this point we're going to go ahead and open up our code editor you'll see that i've created a scripts folder under here i have an authoring and mono a components and tags and finally a systems so first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start off with a data component so i'm just going to do a right click we're gonna do an add class slash interface just to create a new C sharp file. So in this case, we're gonna call it graveyard properties and it is going to be a struct. Okay, so you see that we've now created this empty struct here called graveyard properties and I've just gone ahead and put it under this tmg.zombies namespace. Now this is going to be our first data component. So the way we make this struct a data component is we have it implement the I component data interface. You see that when we do that, this automatically imports the unity.entities namespace here. Now, again, with these data components, we want to make these as friendly with the burst compiler as possible. So we do want to make sure that we're using, you know, only unmanaged data components. Again, simple things like floating point numbers, integers, booleans, things of that nature. So the first thing that we're going to keep track of is the field dimensions. Basically, how large is it in the X and Y directions? I'm going to keep track of that with a public float two variable and a float two is part of the unity.mathematics library. So I'm just going to do an alt enter into uh, go ahead and import the unity.mathematics library right here. And so we can just go ahead and call this the field dimensions. Next up, we want to keep track of the number of tombstones that we want to spawn. And then finally, we're just going to go ahead and do a public entity. And this is going to be the tombstone prefab. So again, we're not using like game object because a game object is a managed type. Um, an entity is an unmanaged type, so we can use this. It can be a field of an I component data. So this will be our tombstone prefab here. Okay, so now let's come back to Unity. We're gonna go ahead and select our graveyard entity here, and we're gonna go ahead and do an add component, and then we'll search for graveyard, and we don't actually get anything. So we need a way to basically add that component to here so we can basically modify all those values in this script right here through the editor. Now in the past, there was a way that we could actually put this generate authoring component attribute on this I component data here. And it basically would create a mono behavior that we could add onto the game object to modify that in the editor. However, that has been removed as far as uh, entities 1.0. So there is a different way that we need to do that. And that is through a custom baker. So the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to go ahead and go to the authoring and mono scripts folder here. We're going to go ahead and do an add and I'm just going to go ahead and add a unity script here. And this is going to be of type mono behavior. So I'll just go ahead and call it graveyard mono. So now at this point, you'll see that we have basically a simple empty mono behavior right here called graveyard mono. And then on here, we can actually go ahead and type out those public fields that we want to actually edit through the editor. So again, first, we're going to do a public float to make sure to import the correct references that will be for field dimensions. We'll do another public integer for number tombstones to spawn. And then finally, we can do a public entity for the tombstone prefab. So this is a little bit incorrect and I'm going to show you why. So now we'll come back over to Unity on the graveyard. We'll do an add component. You'll see that we now have the graveyard mono. So we can go ahead and select on that and you'll see that we only have the field dimensions and number of tombstones to spawn. Now the reason is is because the entity field isn't actually editable inside the uh, Unity editor right now. So we have to do a little bit of a workaround. So we'll have to uh, make this a public game object 
shift instead for the tombstone prefab. We'll come back over to Unity and you see that now the tombstone prefab is asking for a game object here. So here we'll go ahead and set our field dimensions to 40 by 40 for number of tombstones to spawn. Let's go ahead and set 250 and then we'll go ahead and drag in our tombstone prefab into here. So now I'm gonna enter play mode and kind of show you what's happening here. So if we say come over to the entities hierarchy and we'll go ahead and select our graveyard and then go ahead and actually go into the entities view here, you'll see that it basically has all the same standard components. We don't actually see anything about those graveyard properties. That's because we're not actually adding the graveyard's properties data component to this graveyard yet. Basically, all we did is just add this mono behavior and that doesn't really do anything for us. So the way that we actually use this mono behavior to add a new data component to our entity is through something known as a baker. So we'll go ahead and make a public class, make sure it's a class and not a struct, and we can call this the graveyard baker. And this is going to inherit from baker type of graveyard mono. So basically we're just gonna pass in the type of the mono behavior that we're referencing here. Now you see that I have this nice red line under here, it means that we're missing a member from this uh, Baker class here. So I'll just go ahead and say implement missing members. You'll see that we now have this new public override void called bake, which takes in a graveyard mono called authoring. Now that basically this authoring of type graveyard mono, this is a reference to the actual you know mono behavior that's going to be on our game object. Now inside this bake function here, we can go ahead and start adding in methods that will allow us to add data components to our different entities. So luckily enough, it's just easy enough to do an add components. We wanna make sure that we do the one that does not have the type brackets because I do want to actually go ahead and create a new graveyard properties. And then in here I can do open and close curly braces so we can actually set things like the field dimensions. We'll set this equal to authoring.fielddimensions. Next up is the number of tombstones to spawn equal to authoring.number of tombstones to spawn. You see that I'm basically just doing uh, authoring dot. So that's going to go, you know, actually to this mono behavior and it's going to grab the value on that and then go ahead and assign that to the uh, per particular properties for that data component there. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and do tombstone prefab. You'll see that if I do an authoring dot tombstone prefab, and I see that we actually do have a red line under here. And that's because this tombstone prefab, which is part of this mono behavior up here, this is a game object, whereas the graveyard properties tombstone prefab that we're looking for this is an entity so we basically need to just turn this game object into an entity luckily there's an easy enough way that we can do that i'm going to go ahead and surround this with some parentheses and all we just do is a get entity so it's get entity inside the parentheses here just pass in authoring dot tombstone prefab i shall come back over to unity enter play mode and let's go ahead and switch over to our graveyard inside the entity view here and you see that we now have this graveyard properties data component you'll see that the field dimensions is set to 40 by 40 number of tombstones to spawn is 250 and this tombstone prefab this is set to tombstone 57 colon 1 this 57 colon 1 this basically represents the index and version number so this is a tombstone 57 one you can actually double click on this and you can see that this is the actual tombstone prefab entity right here so you'll see that you know these are the different components that are on that uh, particular tombstone entity and up in the entities hierarchy if i go ahead and click this little button to go in the full entities view you can actually see this tombstone entity right here uh, you'll notice that it's it's basically kind of highlighted in blue and this little hexagon is blue as well. That basically indicates that it is a prefab entity as opposed to a regular instance entity that's kind of, you know, inside the, the scene, like the brain or the graveyard here. Okay, great. So now that we have that all working, the next thing that we're going to want to do is go ahead and spawn these tombstones randomly throughout our world. So in order to add random in Unity's entity component system, one way that we can do this is have a random data component that's going to be associated with our graveyard and then from there we can use that to generate random numbers okay so you see here that i've created this new graveyard random data component on here we're just going to have one value which is going to be a public random and we want to make sure that we're using the unity.mathematics random as opposed to the system random or the unity engine random or anything like that 
Uh, again, we do want to make sure that we're using the unity.mathematics random. And then on here, because we just have one single data type on the data component, kind of the common convention is to just go ahead and type value for the name of the uh, variable here. So now we need to go ahead and add this graveyard random component to our graveyard entity. So we'll go ahead and do that through this same baker here. Now, in order to initialize this random, we're going to want a seed, which needs to be an unsigned integer. So we'll go ahead and do a public uint and then we can just call this random seed. Now inside of our baker here, after this uh, previous add component, we're adding the graveyard properties. We're gonna go ahead and do another add component. This is going to be a new graveyard random. And then for the value, we can say random, make sure that again, this is the unity.mathematics random dot create from index. And then in here, we can type in authoring dot random seed. So that basically is how we can kind of initialize this with a random seed here. So we'll come over to our graveyard. We'll go ahead and add in a random seed value of 100. Now, when we check this out in the entity inspector, you'll see that we have a graveyard random. Under here, the value is set to a state and that has this really long number right here. And that's basically just kind of the current random seed. You see that as we kind of continue to generate random numbers, this state value will change every single time we generate a new random number. Okay, so now we have this graveyard that has the graveyard properties as well as the graveyard random. Next thing that we're gonna do is create a system that uses both the graveyard properties as well as graveyard random in order to spawn these tombstones throughout our field. Now there are ways that we can have our systems run off of entities that have both these components, but actually one easy way to do this is a new feature as part of entities 1.0, which is a concept known as aspects. Now aspects basically provides us a way to kind of combine multiple data components into one single easy way for us to interface. And also the net cool thing about these aspects is we can have nice little helper functions on there and it really just ends up making our systems a whole lot cleaner. I can talk a whole lot about aspects, you know, what they are and why they're cool. And I definitely will be doing so in the coming weeks because I've really been liking these a lot so far. So anyways, before we create a system, we're gonna go ahead and create an aspect. And this aspect, it may be a little bit weird seeming to set up at first, but I think you'll see that if you just kind of you know follow along, you'll see why these aspects are super nice to use. So lately I've just been creating my aspects inside this components and tags folder here, but maybe I might want to break them out into a specific aspects folder later on. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new class or interface. This is actually going to be a struct. We'll just go ahead and call this the graveyard aspect. So a couple things that we need to do to this struct. So instead of just doing a public struct, this is going to be a public read only partial struct. That's basically how we have to set up these particular aspects is they need to be read only as well as partial. Uh, that's because the code generation basically takes care of a lot of um, kind of some of the complexities for us. And then so we will implement the I aspect interface here. So now we can go ahead and start adding some things into here. So first thing that I like to do is have a reference to the entity. So the way we do this is just do a public read only entity. And I just typically call it entity with a capital E like that. And then so basically what that does is if we say have a reference to this particular aspect, we can go ahead and access this entity property. And that will basically return us the entity that is associated with that particular aspect. Now, the thing with aspects is they can have, you know, all sorts of different data components. One other thing that they can have is other aspects. So we're going to go ahead and add in another aspect. This is going to be one of only two right now of the built-in aspects. So this is going to be a private read-only transform aspect. And I can just go ahead and call this underscore transform aspect. Basically, there are going to be a couple of operations that we're going to be doing where we actually need to reference the uh, particular transform of this graveyard here. So we just will need a reference to that. Now let's go ahead and actually get references to um, our different data components. So the first one that we're going to need is private read only. And you would normally think to go ahead and say, if we wanted the graveyard properties, we could just do uh, private read only graveyard properties like this. Fortunately, we can't exactly do that. We have to do something um, a little bit before that. We have to make this a ref R O passing in the graveyard properties. And then here we can just call this, you know, underscore 
graveyard properties. This ref RO, this basically means that we have read only access to this graveyard properties. Now, ideally we want to be accessing as many things as possible as read only. Basically the reason for that is when we start scheduling a bunch of jobs, they have all their dependencies. If there are multiple things that have say read only access to a data component, those can all be read in parallel because we're not say writing to them. When we write to them, that's when we need to start being a little bit cautious about you know when we're actually accessing data. And so Unity kind of changes some things around in the scheduling if we have, say, read and write access to a particular component. Basically, all that means to say is if you only need to read from a data component, make sure it's ref RO. And again, in this case, the graveyard properties, these are basically just going to be static throughout the lifetime of our application. So we can just say ref RO inside of here. Next up, we're going to do another private read only. This time we're going to do an a ref rw inside here this is going to be our graveyard random and we can just call this uh, graveyard random so this time we do need a write access to this because inside this aspect here we're going to be generating random numbers again when we generate random numbers it's going to generate a new seed for this underlying random value so we do need write access to it so we can write back that new seed to it otherwise every time we generate a random number it's going to be the same random number which is not very random so this is basically just the very bare bones of what our aspect is right here we're going to be coming back to this and adding a bunch more things throughout the duration of the video but really the important thing here is that in order for an entity to be associated with this particular aspect it needs to have a transform aspect of its own which is basically going to have by default when it has the regular transform components on it also it's going to need the graveyard properties and the graveyard random basically just by having these things on the component this graveyard aspect is going to be associated with that and so we can actually verify that over here in unity so if we go over to say this graveyard and then you see there are, is this tab here next to components for aspects and you'll see what are the aspects associated with it so you see that we have the transform aspect again this is you know, pretty much by default and we do also have this graveyard aspect okay so now we're going to go ahead and create our first system so i'm going to go ahead and right click on this we're going to go ahead and add a class interface again we're going to do another struct and this is going to be the spawn tomb stone system so you see that we have this public struct spawn tombstone system now again, this is going to take advantage of source generation. So we need to make this a public partial struct spawn tombstone system. And this is going to implement I system. So I system is kind of the preferred method for creating systems in entities 1.0 and beyond. That's because I systems are fully burst compatible. The other one that you'll commonly see are system base. System base are still okay to use, but typically you only want to use those when you need to use managed data components. So I'd say just by default, use I system, but if I system doesn't work, go ahead and use system base. So you'll see that again, we do have a nice red line here because we do need to implement some missing members. You see that there are actually three of them that we need to implement. So see there's the on create, on destroy, and on update. So basically these systems have a little bit of a life cycle. So as you could imagine, you know, the on create is kind of called when the game begins, and then we can kind of do some setup logic in here. Of course, on destroy happens when these systems get destroyed, and then on update, that's going to happen every single frame. Now, a couple things that we need to do. We do want to mark this as burst compiled. So we'll go ahead and go up here and we'll go ahead and add the attribute for burst compile. And then we actually do need to add this burst compile attribute to any of the methods inside of the I system here. So I'll just go ahead and add this to all three of these. Now I'm gonna go ahead and remove this, uh, you know, not implemented exception on these guys as well, because we don't really care about that yelling at us. The other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add one more attribute at the top of this system. And this is actually going to be the update in group. And then here we can do type of initialization system group. Again, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are a couple built in system groups. So the initialization system group is kind of the first one. So we're gonna go ahead and have this run um, basically before the initial simulation system group runs. So I'm gonna go ahead and come into this on update function here. Now we don't actually want this system to update every single frame. Again, we only want these tombstones to basically spawn once at the beginning of our game. 
So the first thing that I'm gonna do is actually just disable this system. Now, disabling the system, any of the code after it inside the on update is still gonna to continue to run, but I just don't want it to you know, update a second and third in time and so on. So all we we'll do is just do a state, which we do get from this kind of you know system state, which is being passed in here. So this state kind of gives us access to a bunch of things here. So I just do states.enabled equals false. So that basically just immediately disables the system. And I can actually showcase this to you by entering play mode and then going down to the systems window where it's going to show us all the active systems in the game. So if we go into this initialization system group and open this up, we do have this spawn tombstone system here. So basically just by creating this I system, it's going to essentially initialize it by default and put it into the default world. And then you'll see by putting the uh, enabled property equal to false, you see that it actually disables it here. So if you kind of compare this, this is a, looks a little bit grayed out compared to the other ones. You'll see that this plug also has kind of like an X through on it here. And you know, we can even do this with any system. We can just go ahead and like disable any system that we want to and just re-enable that. Um, this one, you're not actually gonna see it re-enable because right when we re-enable it, it just gets disabled again right away. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do is get a reference to our graveyard entity. Once we have our graveyard entity, I'm gonna grab the graveyard aspect from it. Now we know that this graveyard entity Entity is essentially a singleton because it's the only entity in our game that has a graveyard properties data component on it. So there's a way that we can easily get our graveyard entity by using the system API, which again is a new feature of entities 1.0. And then here we can just do a get singleton entity. We want to make sure that we're doing a get singleton entity. So it actually returns us the entity. And then here we type in the data component type. So in this case, it's the graveyard property. So basically it's going to locate the singleton with the graveyard properties and then it's going to return that entity to this graveyard entity. Now again, we do want the graveyard aspect from it. So I'll just call this uh, graveyard because um, it's just nice and easy when we just say graveyard for the aspects here. Um, so again, we can use the system API and do a get aspect. And in this case, we want to do a get aspect RW. Again, it's really important that we need to consider, you know, when we want read only access or read and write access. Again, we do want to do RW because again, we're going to be writing to that random component when we use it. Um, so here we just type in the name of our aspect, which is the graveyard aspect. And then in here we type in the entity that we want to get it off of. So of course that's going to be our graveyard entity. So then here we can actually look into our graveyard aspect and see what we see by just doing a graveyard dots. And then you see that basically all we have here is an entity and create aspect. So what we want to do here is just do a basic for loop and we're just going to you know, loop through the number of tombstones that we want to spawn. So now we can go back over to our graveyard aspect and we can give us a nice, clean, easy way for us to reference this. So we can do a public int. This doesn't necessarily need to be a read only int because this is just a property. And so we can call this number tombstones to spawn. And then in here, we can actually go ahead and do our graveyard properties dot. We have to say value ro dot number tombstones to spawn. So that's basically kind of, you know, how we can get read only access to a particular value of a data component. So now we can say do a for loop where I starts at zero to the upper bounds of graveyard dot number of tombstones to spawn. Now, the first thing that we're gonna do inside this for loop is actually spawn a new tombstone entity. Now, there are a number of ways that we can actually spawn these entities. One way that you can use is something known as the entity manager. Only issue with the entity manager is, you know, if we keep doing these operations over and over and over again, it ends up getting a little bit slow. So a actually a better way that we can spawn all these entities into our world is using something known as an entity command buffer. Now, the entity command buffer is a really important topic to know about. Basically, what you can think of this as is, you know, we can basically queue up commands inside this entity command buffer and they get played back at a later time. So there are ways that we can create our own entity command buffers, which is what we're doing right here. And there's also ways that we can hook into some built-in entity command buffers, which is what we'll be doing later on. Now, there are a couple advantages for this because these entity command buffers, these often do things known as structure structural changes. Now, structural changes are when we do things like spawning entities, destroying entities, adding components or removing components, 
basically anything that's going to change the makeup of you know where an entity actually exists in memory. The reason that these structural changes are important to know about is because these structural changes basically it requires a sync point before they execute and a sync point basically means that all scheduled jobs in the entire application need to be completed before that sync point has been run. So because of that, it's really important for us to minimize the number of sync points that we're incurring. And it's often preferred just to use the built-in sync points that Unity provides us already. However, in this case, we're just basically doing a basic initialization system. So the you know performance doesn't really matter all too much. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a local command buffer. We're gonna go ahead and schedule all those commands and then basically play them back immediately. So before this for loop here, I'm just gonna go ahead and and create a new entity command buffer. I'll call it ECB. So we'll set this equal to a new entity command buffer. Inside here, it's asking for an allocator and we need to do um, allocator.temp. Now there are a couple different allocator types that we can use. So we can do a temp, a temp job, or a persistent. Now this will become a little bit more relevant when we get into collections. You can basically think of anything that we're allocating with the temp allocation needs to be disposed within that same frame that is allocated. The temp job is a little bit more lenient because we need to dispose it within four frames. And then the persistent is going to be the most expensive, but that means that that data can persist throughout the duration of our application. So now that we have our entity command buffer, let's go ahead and queue up some commands into this. So the first thing that we're gonna do is do an ecb.instantiate. And then here we basically pass in the prefab entity that we want to instantiate. So let's go back to our graveyard aspect Let's go ahead and create another one of these public properties. So we'll go ahead and do a public entity, call this the tombstone prefab. And then of course, we'll set this equal to our graveyard properties dot value read only dot tombstone prefab. Then we can come back over to here and then we can just do graveyard dot tombstone prefab. So this will basically register the command to spawn a tombstone into our world. So now we answer play mode. You'll see that we actually are getting an error. I forgot about this error and um, I do just want to address this real quick before moving on. You'll see that we do have this um, invalid operation except get singleton requires exactly one entity exists that matches the query but there are zero the reason for that is because when this on update system runs and we try and do a get singleton entity this entity with the graveyard properties doesn't actually exist yet and that's basically just kind of due to the way that the baking and conversion all happens here so an easy workaround to that is if we just go up into the on create here we can just do a state dot require for update and then inside the type brackets here we can just go ahead ahead and do our graveyard properties. So this basically means that the update function is only going to run if at least one entity with the graveyard properties data component exists in the application. Now we can come over to Unity and enter play mode and you'll see that basically nothing happens. We don't have any new tombstones inside of our entity's hierarchy or anything like that. This is because we're not actually playing back the commands of the entity command buffer. So outside our for loop, I'm just going to go ahead and do an ecb.playback. Inside here, it's asking for an entity manager to actually do the playback. And of course, we can just get to that using our system states, uh, which we just do state.entityManager, just like that. So now we'll go ahead and enter play mode here. And you'll see in the entities hierarchy, we now have a ton of tombstones. So there should be 250 of them here. However, we don't actually see them in our world, but they're all going to be hiding inside this brain right here. So, you know, even though this just looks like one tombstone, it's actually 250. So this is basically just spawning them all at the origin position in our world right here. So now the next thing that we'll do is actually spawn these tombstones stones throughout our game world. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and come back to the aspect here and we're going to create a little helper function on here. And this is again going to just kind of make our system a little bit cleaner just so we don't have a whole bunch of code cluttering up our system here. So we're going to go ahead and create a public uniform scale transform. Now the uniform scale transform as part of the new entities 1.0 uh, translation system. Basically, this gives us a way for our entities to have a position, a rotation, and a uniform scale. A uniform scale is basically where the, you know, X, Y, and Z of the scale components are all the same value, which is, you know, a lot 
more computationally easy on the computer than having a non-uniform scale. And so we can call this uh, get random tombstone transform. And so we'll go ahead and just return a new uniform scale transform. Inside here, we're gonna end up setting our position, our rotation, and our scale. And so we're gonna do these things all one at a time here. And so we'll start off with position. So we'll just go ahead and do a private float three, get random position. So in here, we're going to define a float three random position. And here we can set random position equal to our graveyard random dot value RW. Again, we want to do RW because we need to write back to this random component here dot value dot next float three. And then in here, we can kind of pass in the minimum and maximum here. So you see that I've just gone ahead and created these private little properties for uh, min corner and max corner. This basically just takes the transform position and adds or subtract half of the dimensions. And we're getting half the dimensions just by, you know, getting our field dimensions in the X and Y direction, of course, multiply them by uh, 0.5. So in here, we can go ahead and do uh, min corner max corner and then we'll go ahead and return random position now there is a reason that I'm separating this out and I'll show you why in just a sec we here we can set the position equal to get random position uh, for now we'll just set rotation to quaternion dot identity and scale can be equal to one. So just to kind of test this out, we'll come back to our spawn tombstone system here, and we're gonna go ahead and get a var new tombstone transform, set this equal to graveyard dot get random tombstone transform. And now we actually want to set the transform component of this new entity that we spawned. So we can actually get a reference to this entity just by doing a var new tombstone equals. And of course, we can still use the entity command buffer to do an ecb dot set component. Inside here, we'll pass in the entity, which is the new tombstone. And then second, it's asking for the component. Now this new tombstone transform, this isn't actually a data component. We actually need to go ahead and create this data component by doing a new local to world transform inside here we'll set value equal to the new tombstone transform so this kind of goes into the new uh, transform system as part of 1.0 and it is a fair bit different than the previous ones but basically we have this local to world transform component which on here the actual underlying value of it is this uniform scale transform so when we go ahead and set that now we can test this out by coming back to unity so i'll go ahead and enter play mode and you'll now see that we do have a bunch of these tombstones basically spawning throughout our entire game world here now a couple things that i do want to clean up here these are basically all the you know same size and rotation and they're kind of you know overlapping the brain in some places so we don't necessarily want all that so we can go ahead and clean some of this up here so we'll go on to our graveyard aspect we'll come back to this get random position here now we're going to go ahead and put this inside of a do while here so we'll go ahead and take this out put that back in there other thing that i'm going to do is go ahead and add a constant variable which is this brain safety radius squared which is set to a value of 100 so that basically means this you know kind of safety radius is anything inside of 10 units from the brain position so inside of our while we'll just go ahead and say while math again this is uh, lowercase m math this is our new unity mathematics library dot distance sq inside here we can do our transform aspect dot position again we do have the uh, transform aspect as part of our graveyard aspect so this is the actual transform of the graveyard and then here we want to check the distance with the random position we're going to do this while this is less than or equal to the brain safety radius squared. So basically any random number that's inside this safety radius, it's just gonna go ahead and loop through this until we find a value that's outside of that. And then, so now when we enter play mode, you see that we now have a little bit of a distance here um, basically from the brain for you know all these tombstones so we kind of have you know just a little bit of a room for the zombies to kind of you know walk across the field here so then next up i'm just going to create two different methods for get random rotation and get random scale basically the way that this is going to work is we're going to do a quaternion this is the lowercase q quaternion so this is kind of the you know new mathematics uh, unity quaternion here 
dot rotate y so this is basically going to rotate it against the y axis and again we're just going to do uh, getting a random float here between negative 0.25 f and 0.25 f just to kind of you know rotate the graves a little bit and then also we're going to do a get random scale where we pass in the minimum scale that we want and then again this just gets us a random scale value here so if we come up to our get random tombstone transform for rotation we'll say get random rotation and then for scale we'll do a get random scale inside of here we'll pass in 0.5 f so coming back to unity and entering play mode here you'll see that now we do have just a little bit more randomness and it looks a little bit more lifelike here so we kind of have you know all these graves that um, now are kind of all in like random sizes and they're all kind of like oriented just kind of a little bit random and jagged and stuff like that hey just wanted to cut in here real quick to mention that i did have a section in this video where i basically just really quickly ran through um, how i randomized the textures on these two tombstones and as I was editing it it didn't really seem like it fit all in the video all that well I mean I really just ran through it really quickly to give kind of a high level overview about how everything was happening and it didn't really just make sense to include in this video um, but if you do download the project files I will have all the code and shaders and everything to set that up basically I used the material property overrides which I showcase in this video right here to basically just randomize the offset of the textures for these particular tombstones again just to have them with a little bit less of a uniform look so as you go throughout this video you will see that the textures on these are randomized um, but just note that I'm skipping that out um, again go ahead and reference that other video if you want to learn more about material property overrides and do check out the final code because it will have everything set up in there for you the next thing that we're going to do is basically get store a reference to all these spawn points now the spawn points are basically if we go to any of these tombstones we basically go two units down and one unit over then those are basically going to be these spawn points for the zombies so the zombies are basically going to you know rise up out of the grave and then from there they're going to start walking towards the brain so now there are multiple ways that we can actually store array like data on an entity one particular way is using a blob asset now blob assets are really great and they have a whole lot of advantages and i've made a video going into depth on them I um, really do like them, but they are a little bit cumbersome to use. And so it's maybe a little bit more excessive than necessary for this particular use case. The other common one that's been available to us in the past is a dynamic buffer. We will be using dynamic buffers a little bit later on for some things. Um, but again, that's just a couple extra steps for setup with them. However, as of Entities 1.0, we can now have the ability to store native collections inside of a data component. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create a data component with a native array, and then we're going to populate that native array with all these spawn points in our world so I've just gone ahead and created this new data component here for zombie spawn points and so we'll just go ahead and create a public native array of type float three because we want this to represent an xyz position and of course because we just have one value we could just call this value so now we want this array to be a part of our graveyard so we'll go ahead and go over to our graveyard baker here and then we'll just go ahead and do an add components this time we're going to use the one with the type brackets and just pass in a zombie spawn points right there so that's basically just going to add an empty zombie spawn points array to our graveyard entity next up we're actually going to populate this native array with all these spawn points so in order to do that nice and cleanly we're just going to come over to our graveyard aspect here and add a couple more things so first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add in another private read only ref rw for the zombie spawn points of course we can just call this zombie spawn points and then here we can do a public native array of type float three called zombie spawn points just make a public property for this here so we can do a get and we'll set this equal to the zombie spawn points dot value dot ro again because we're just reading the data we can do an ro on here dot value and then for set we're going to go ahead and return zombie spawn points dot value dot rw dot value equals to value so this is basically just how we can set up this public property to assign a new value to this zombie spawn points here okay so we'll come back to our spawn tombstone system and now we're going to go ahead and populate the array with all these zombie spawn points now there are a couple ways that we can go about doing this uh, probably the most straightforward way what we're going to do is we're going to allocate a temporary list then we're just going to add all these new spawn points to that list 
and then at the end we're just going to go ahead and uh, convert that list to a native array and assign it to our native array that's on the graveyard so here we can just do a var spawn points is equal to a new native list of course it's going to be of type float three here it's going to want an allocator so we can go ahead and do an allocator dot temp because we are going to be uh, essentially getting rid of this after the fact here also let's just go ahead and create a tombstone offset we'll set this equal to a new float three of zero negative two and one so now inside this for loop we can say var new zombie spawn point is equal to the new tombstone transform dot position again this is the base origin position of the tombstone plus the tombstone offset so now we can just add that to our temporary list here just by doing a spawn points dot add passing in our new zombie spawn point here. Go ahead and separate that out for clarity. And then at the end, basically, you know, after this for loop here, we can just do a graveyard dot zombie spawn points is equal to spawn points dot two array. And then in here we pass in the allocator that we want the array to be. And we want this to be an allocator dot persistent because we want it to persist the duration of our application. Okay, and we'll come back over to Unity. We can go ahead and select the graveyard here. Let's go over to the entities mode. And you see that down at the bottom, we do have a zombie spawn points um, data component here. However, we can't actually see the values on here. I hope they do improve that in the future where we actually can see all the uh, array values here. But we'll just have to trust that all the spawn points are correct and then we'll go ahead and fix them if they are incorrect later. So next thing that we're gonna go ahead and do is actually just create a zombie prefab. You'll see that I've created this guy right here. You see that I've basically just made it out of um, some primitives here. So we kind of have like a sphere for the head and the eyes, the mouth is actually a capsule um, and then cylinders for the remainder of the body parts. And then you'll see that kind of similar to the tombstone, we basically just have this like base empty game object here. And then everything is just a child under that basically just so we have, you know, the origin position kind of, you know, right under its legs here. And that's going to allow us to do, you know, a couple of interesting things when we get into like the, uh, you know, walking and eating animations. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to want to go ahead and do is actually spawn some zombies into our world. So we can come back to our graveyard properties here and we're going to go ahead and create a new public entity for the zombie prefab. You can also go ahead and create a public float for the zombie spawn rate. So basically the zombie prefab gonna be similar to the tombstone prefab where we're just going to have this entity that we can spawn into the world whenever we want. Now this zombie spawn rate, this is basically going to be representative of the time in seconds of how frequently we want to spawn zombies into the world. Now in order to actually keep track of this, we're gonna go ahead and create a separate data component which is going to be a public struct zombie spawn timer which is an i component data which just has a public float for value now the reason that we do this we want to do have this separate than the graveyard properties because we're going to be continually writing to this spawn timer basically we're just going to decrement this value by delta time every frame and then when it reaches zero we're going to go ahead and spawn an entity and then we'll go ahead and actually reset this timer to this zombie spawn rate valuable value right here. So again, we're only ever going to be reading from this zombie spawn rate. Um, again, you know, everything inside this graveyard properties, this is all read only stuff. So then we just need to be sure to update our mono behavior so we can have a public game object for the zombie prefab and also a public float for the zombie spawn rate. So then in here, when we're setting up our graveyard properties, let's go ahead and add in a zombie prefab is equal to get entity authoring dot zombie prefab. And then the zombie spawn rate is equal to authoring dot zombie spawn rate. And then here we can just also go ahead and do an add component for the zombie spawn timer. So we make sure that we also have a timer on that game object entity graveyard. So now we can come back over to Unity. We'll set our zombie prefab to the zombie here. We'll just go ahead and set an initial spawn rate of three seconds. So again, if we come over to our graveyard aspect, we do have uh, read-only access to this graveyard properties. And now we're just gonna go ahead and add in a uh, private read-only ref 
R W for the zombie spawn timer. Of course, just call it zombie spawn timer. Okay, so now we'll stay in the graveyard aspect. We're gonna go ahead and add a couple, uh, you know, helper properties and methods and all that. So the first is just going to be a public float for the zombie spawn timer which is just going to be a public property with a getter and setter again for the getters prefer to use the value.ro and for the setters make sure you're using the value.rw and then we can create another public property for time to spawn zombie so this will be true if it's less than or equal to zero so we know when we can actually spawn the zombie so now we'll go ahead and create our new spawn zombie system this is going to be another i system here make sure we do have these life cycle functions for on create on destroy and on update now we're actually going to start outside of this I system for now. We're gonna create something known as an I job entity. Now an iJob entity, I've done a whole video kind of going over what these are and how to use them. But basically they are kind of a way that we can easily create jobs inside of Unity's entity component system. Now inside these iJob entities, we're basically going to give it some information about what entities that we're going to be iterating across of. Again, these iJob entities, we're really going to be you know, iterating across a group of entities. Although in this case, we're only going to be iterating across this one single graveyard. We're still again going to be treating it as if we were iterating across a group of many graveyards. So the way that we actually define these iJob entities is we're gonna go ahead and make a public partial struct. And we'll go ahead and give this a name, which we can call this the spawn zombie job. This is going to implement the I job entity interface right there. Now, one thing that we do want to make sure to do is go ahead and add the burst compile attribute here. And you see that it doesn't yell at us for implementing any members or anything like that. Uh, but there is one that we can implement. So this is going to be a private void called execute. And inside the parameters of the execute method, this is kind of where we define our entity query. So we say, you know, anything that has the particular components that we're going to be passing into here, this is what we're going to be iterating across of. So we can actually pass in an aspect in here. So this is, you know, extremely handy because we can, you know, again, access multiple components just by using this one single aspect. So we'll just go ahead and pass in this graveyard aspect called a graveyard. So then what we can do is do our graveyard dot zombie spawn timer we'll do minus equals and we now we need to subtract delta time now we can't actually just get delta time from inside the ijob entity we do have to pass this in as a parameter here so here we'll do a public float for delta time and we'll go ahead and actually set this later on when we schedule the job but here we can just do zombie timer minus equals delta time and then next we can check if not graveyard dot time to spawn zombie we'll just go ahead and return so that basically means that if it is time to spawn the zombie you know we'll go ahead and continue if it's not time to spawn the zombie we'll just go ahead and return here so if it is time to spawn the zombie the first thing that we're going to just want to go ahead and do is just reset that zombie spawn timer so graveyard dot zombie spawn timer is equal to graveyard dot. I do actually need to expose that inside of our aspect here. So we can just do a public float zombie spawn rate graveyard properties value read only dot zombie spawn rate. So then here we can reset the zombie spawn timer to zombie spawn rate. Next up, we're gonna wanna go ahead and actually spawn this zombie into our world. Now again, we're gonna be using an entity command buffer to take care of this. Again, we can't actually just create an entity command buffer inside this job struct here, so we'll have to pass one in. So we'll go ahead and do a public entity command buffer, and we can just call this ECB. So then here we can say var new zombie is equal to ecb.instantiate. And inside here, I do also need to expose the zombie prefab. So real quick, we'll just go ahead and do a public entity zombie prefab, go ahead and return graveyard properties, value read only zombie prefab. So we'll come here and go ahead and instantiate the graveyard dot zombie prefab. So at this point, we can kind of schedule this job to test things out before we start, you know, getting a little bit more crazy and spawn them to all the different points in our world. So here we'll come up to the on update function. So basically, you know, the way this is gonna work is we're going to schedule this iJob entity 
every single frame because every single frame we basically do want to you know decrement this zombie spawn timer and then potentially spawn a zombie if we need to so we can go ahead and create a new spawn zombie job and in here we can set the values for delta time now we can't actually set the delta time right inside the this zombie spawn job here like this unfortunately there is a little bit of a bug so we do actually have to get it outside of here first just capture it here so we just do a var delta time equal to system api dot time dot delta time again taking advantage of that system api again very very handy stuff so we'll set delta time equal to delta time for the entity command buffer this one's going to be a little bit interesting so here we're going to use one of the built-in entity command buffers again i did mention that there are you know a couple of entity command buffers that are basically already you know built into the player loop ideally we do want to take advantage of these when possible because these are basically you know already pre-existing sync points where structural changes you know naturally happen anyways so basically the process to do this is first we need to go ahead and get the entity command buffer singleton which is associated with the entity command buffer system now again i do have a video going fairly into detail on entity command buffers however the api has changed a little bit as of 1.0 but basically you know each of these entity command buffer systems basically play back the changes in our entity command buffer that we've recorded you know wherever we want to and in this case we're going to be taking advantage of the begin initialization entity command buffer system basically what this is going to mean is that we're going to you know queue up the spawning operations for all these zombies and we're actually going to to spawn them on the next frame. Now, there are a couple of reasons that we may want to do this. Most often, the number one reason that we're going to be wanting to do this is because, you know, if we were to say spawn it later on in this frame, well, that's actually going to, you know, take place after some of the particular transform system groups have, you know, already made their updates. It's actually going to look like the zombie spawns in the incorrect location for one single frame before moving over to the correct location. It's just kind of a weird quirk about how ECS is all set up. Um, go check out my videos on spawning prefabs using Unity's entity component system. It does give you a little bit more information and context on those. So anyways, first thing is that we need to get is the EC be singleton so we can get this again using the system api dot get singleton and here we're making sure that we're doing the get singleton not get singleton entity now here's where we pass in the entity command buffer type that we want so this is the begin initialization entity command buffer system and then we have to do a dot singleton and then so that will actually get us the singleton that is associated with the begin initialization entity command buffer system so now once we have that singleton we can actually create a command buffer from that so now back in where we're scheduling our zombie spawn job we can set ecb equal to ecb singleton dot create command buffer inside here it's asking for this you know world unmanaged called world we can basically just get this from the system state again just by doing state dot world unmanaged so now that basically sets up the values um, inside this job here now we actually need to go ahead and tell this job to run so we're just going to go ahead and do a dot run again this is just going to run it right on the main thread right then and there um, this is totally fine for this use case because again we only have one graveyard in our game so this is not necessarily like operating across a bunch of entities and you know at the very most we're only going to be spawning one entity per frame but most often we're not even going to be spawning any entities we're just decrementing a timer okay so now we can go ahead and test this out so we're just going to go ahead and enter play mode I'm going to zoom into the brain here and we should see a zombie spawning right here if we go ahead and check out the entities hierarchy um, we do see that we do have this zombie right here and then I think if I scroll down to the bottom, okay, so we do see, you know, a couple more here. We should wait, you know, about every three seconds, we should see another zombie spawning. Again, it's just right now spawning at the 000 origin position. So basically, you know, we have maybe like 10 entities in the game at this point but um, basically they're all just right on top of each other. And then if we actually inspect the graveyard, if we look at this zombie spawn timer, you see that it basically counts three, two, one, zero, and then resets. So, you know, that's exactly the behavior that we want. So now let's actually get them to spawn at all those spawn points that we've put under the tombstones. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another thing on this graveyard aspect that's gonna be very similar to this get random tombstone transform, where it's going to return a uh, public uniform scale transform. This time it's going to be the 
get zombie spawn point. We'll go ahead and return a new uniform scale transform. So for position, we're gonna go ahead and go ahead and have a little private helper here, which is gonna return a float three, get random zombie spawn point. So this is going to return um, from our zombie spawn points array. At position, we're gonna go ahead and do um, the graveyard random dot value read write dot value dot next int. And then inside here, we can pass in the max number, which is uh, zombie spawn points dot length. So basically, let me just break this down real quick. Basically, we have this zombie spawn points array, which we kind of populated. That's those, you know, all those positions that are sitting under the tombstones. And then from there, we're just basically going to get a random index from that. And we can, of course, use this existing graveyard random. And we do need to get read and write access to that again to write back to that random component. The dot value is the actual uh, random portion of this random component here. And then next int basically means that we're just going to generate an integer with the maximum value being the zombie spawn points dot length now when we pass in a maximum value like this it's it's not going to you know ever actually be that maximum value it's going to only return a number between zero and then one number previous to that so it makes it easy for doing you know a random index into an array like that so position would we'll do get random position for rotation to get the rotation i've gone ahead and created a static class called math helpers which has a public static method called a get heading where basically we pass in the object position and the target position. And then basically using the uh, X and Z target positions, we use the ATAN2 function. And then basically using the X and Z positions of the object position and the target position, we're just gonna go ahead and return math.atan passing in X and Y. Basically what that's just going to do is give us a radian heading you know, from the zombie to the brain. So here we can do quaternion dot rotate y and then passing in the float for the angle where we can do our math helpers dot get heading and here we need to pass in the position so i'm just going to go ahead and um, cache this position here first and so we'll set position equal to get random zombie spawn point so then here we can actually just set this to position and then this to position, and then we'll go ahead and do our transform aspect dot position. So that's basically going to be the origin position of the graveyard, which is basically where the brain is spawned. And then finally for scale, we're not gonna do any random scale here, so we can just do one F. So now we can come back to our spawn zombie system, and then inside this job here, now we can go ahead and use the new zombie transform. Set this, of course, equal to the graveyard dot get zombie spawn point. And then again, we can just do an ECB dot set component on the new zombie. You know, we do have to do a new local to world transform. And then for the value, set this equal to the new zombie transform. Again, you know, pretty similar to what we did for spawning the tombstones. Okay, and then before we test this out, I do just have to fix one bug here. Um, so if we just do an if graveyard dot zombie spawn points dot length is equal to zero, just go ahead and return out of this a um, little bit of an issue where if the uh, zombie spawn points isn't been fully populated yet then uh, we end up just spawning a zombie at the origin position which is not necessarily the behavior that we want so just kind of a quick hack fix to that for now so anyways if we can just go ahead and enter play mode here you'll see that if we look around we don't see any spawnies spawnies zombies above the ground if you go into the brain we don't see any either however if we go below the ground we'll start to see the zombies spawning at their spawn points so you see that it is basically you know under the grave and kind of you know a little bit um, offset from it and so this is exactly what we want right now so we kind of have these zombies that are all spawned under the world here the next step to do is go ahead and actually get them to rise up above the ground okay so here i've just gone ahead and created a new data component for the zombie rise rate you see that it's just a public float for value so this is basically just going to determine you know how quickly these zombies rise up out of the ground next up i've gone ahead and created a zombie mono which just has a public field for the rise rate and a zombie baker which is just going to add that zombie rise rate to the zombie so we will come back over to unity we'll go to our zombie prefab and here we can go ahead and add in 
the uh, zombie mono here. We'll set it to a rise rate of 0.5. So now again, to make things a little bit easier, we're gonna go ahead and create an aspect for the zombie. Now we're actually gonna be creating multiple aspects for the zombie. We're going to have you know one for the different stages of the zombies kind of life cycle. So we're gonna have a zombie, a rise aspect, a zombie walk aspect, and a zombie eat aspect. So again, I've just created a public read-only partial struct for the zombie rise aspect aspect which implements i aspect and I just have a public read only entity which has an a reference to the entity here so again we're going to be modifying the transform of this zombie so of course we can have a read only reference to the transform aspect we we'll also want private read only uh, do a ref ro on the rise rate type here we can just call this uh, zombie rise rate. And again, we're just gonna be reading from this data here. So we can have a public void called rise, which takes in a float value for delta time. And here we'll just go ahead and set the transform aspect dot position plus equals math dot up multiplied by our zombie rise rate dot value ro dot value multiplied by delta time so we're just going to break this down real quick all we're going to be doing is modifying the transforms position we're going to be incrementing it by math dot up which is basically just a shorthand way of doing a float three of zero one zero so basically just one in the up direction again multiplying this by our rise rate again we're just doing a read only on that and then multiplying it by by delta time to normalize out for frame rate. So I'll go ahead and create a new system here, which is the zombie rise system. Of course, this is just a basic I system here. Now, outside of this, I'm just gonna go ahead and define a basic I job entity here. Again, it's a public partial struct, which I've called zombie rise job, of course, implementing I job entity. Make sure we have these burst compile attributes, um, both on the struct and the function here. So inside this execute method, let's just go ahead and say zombie.rise. Again, we do need Need to pass in delta time which again we do have to get out here so we'll do a public float for delta time and then inside here we can just pass in delta time uh, so now let's actually just go ahead and schedule this job real quick so we'll go ahead and create a new zombie rise job and then we do need to get delta time outside of here so we'll say var delta time is equal to System API dot time dot delta time. Go ahead and set delta time equal to delta time. Uh, this time, because we know that, you know, it's potentially that we could have many, many zombies rising up from the ground at once. We're going to go ahead and instead of doing a dot run like we did previously, we're going to go ahead and do a dot schedule parallel. So this is basically going to schedule this to run on multiple worker threads. So now we shall come back over to Unity and you see a couple things happening. First, we're getting, you know, all sorts of error messages in here. Um, I do want to showcase a couple error messages just because, you know, if you are going to be programming a lot in Unity's dots, you probably will see a number of error messages. So I want to give you some information about how to handle these. So let's see what this is saying here. So this says invalid operation exception, the pre Previously scheduled job zombie rise job writes to the component handle unity transforms local to world transform and then furthermore it says you are trying to schedule a new job spawn zombie job which writes to the same component type handle yada 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 Can, to guarantee safety you must include zombie rise job as a dependency of the new scheduled job so here's basically what's happening I'm gonna go ahead and open up the systems window and show you kind of the system update order here so if we look kind of in inside the update and then inside the simulation system group, you'll see that we have the zombie rise system and then the zombie spawn system. Now this means that the zombie rise system is actually running before the zombie spawn system. Now in this zombie rise system, which is this one that we just created here, you'll see that we're doing a schedule parallel. So that basically means, you know, all this work inside this iJob entity where we're actually rising the zombie from the ground. Again, going to here, we're actually modifying that transform dot position here that's not actually happening right now that's not actually going to be happening until later until there's a worker thread available to actually run that work now immediately after that we're executing a system where we create this sponge zombie job now we just immediately go ahead and run that on the main thread now this is a little bit of an issue because in both systems we are writing to that transform component type now unity starts freaking out because if we're say from two different systems 
trying to write to the same place in memory, that's going to cause a little bit of an issue because we do not know exactly, you know, which system is going to have the final say about, you know, where an entity is. So there are actually a number of different ways to handle this. To be honest, the easiest way is if we go to our zombie rise system, and I'm just going to go ahead and say update after type of spawn zombie system. So this basically means the spawn zombie system is going to run. That's going to you know do the work that it needs to. Again, this is running on the main thread. So this is basically going to be completed within this block of code before moving on to the next system. Again, this next system is the one that we're actually you know scheduling out this work here. So that data has already been written to by the previous system. So now we can safely schedule out this work. Now, if we're to say schedule the work inside the spawn zombie job, then that wouldn't be an issue because Unity would take care of the dependency handling for us. So now if we enter play mode, you'll see that we don't have any error messages in the console here. And then if we look around our game world, you see that we now have these zombies that are just rising up out of the ground and they're just going to continue going up and up and up and up like the rapture. However, that's not exactly what we want, even though it's you know kind of silly and maybe we could <laughs> make some kind of a game out about that. But basically we just kind of wanted to detect, you know, once the zombies are at or above ground level, let's just go ahead and snap them to the ground level. So back in the zombie rise aspect, you'll see that I do have this public bool for is above ground. We're basically just checking to see if the transforms position dot y is greater than or equal to zero. And then also I do have a public method for set at ground level where we just go ahead and set the position dot y equal to zero. Of course, we do just need to grab a copy of that, you know, modify the copy and set it back to the position. So now in the zombie rise system, what we can actually go ahead and do is we say if not zombie is above ground, just go ahead and return. So that means if it's not yet above the ground, it's just going to go ahead and return. And then the next frame is going to try and, you know, rise it a little bit more again. Um, however, if it is now above ground, we'll just go ahead and say zombie dot set at ground level. Okay, so now enter play mode. We'll see that we have a zombie rising up out of the ground. And then right when it hits the ground level, it's basically going to stop. I think there's another one here. So that's basically stopped now. And you'll see that, you know, same one, same thing here. Okay, now the system isn't necessarily the most efficient because let's go over to our systems window again, and we'll go over to our zombie rise system. And you look at this entity count number right here. So this entity count number, every few seconds, this is just going to increment by one. Basically what this means is that, you know, every time a new zombie is spawned, now that zombie rise system is going to be affecting that new zombie. Now we only need the zombie rise system to act upon the zombie for a couple seconds while it's actually just, you know, rising that entity up above the ground. Once that entity is up above the ground, it no longer needs to participate in this zombie rise system. So one way that we can do this, again, kind of going back to the beginning where I was talking about how, you know, we can add or remove components to determine, you know, the particular systems that are running on an entity. What we're just going to go ahead and do here is remove the rise rate component from the zombie, because once the zombie has been risen up out of the ground, it no longer needs that zombie rise component. And then once that component has been removed from the entity, it's no longer going to participate in the zombie rise system. So of course, we can remove components by using the entity command buffer. So we'll come back to this zombie rise job. Again, we do need to get a reference to the entity command buffer, uh, basically as a variable for this job. So of course we can just call this ECB. And then, you know, after this, we can do an ECB dot remove components. And we're just going to go ahead and remove the zombie rise rate. And we want to remove that from the zombie entity. Again, we can just get that by doing zombie.entity. So we're actually getting the uh, entity associated with this aspect here. And so this time we're gonna use another of those built-in entity command buffers. So uh, again, we do need to get the ECB singleton first. And so we'll do system.api.get singleton. This time we're going to be using the end simulation entity command buffer system dot singleton. Now this basically just happens uh, kind of at the end of the simulation phase of the player loop here. So next up, we're just gonna go ahead and set ECB equal to the cb singleton dot create command buffer again we do just need to pass in the state dot world unmanaged here now this is incorrect 
but I'm gonna be showing you why, because it is an important thing to consider. So go ahead and enter play mode here, and you'll see that we can get all these invalid operation exceptions here. So you'll see invalid operation exception, zombie rise job, uh, job data ECB, not declared read only and iJob parallel four, uh, but the important part says the container does not support parallel writing. Please use a more suitable container type. Now issue is, is that the regular entity command buffer can't actually write in parallel. Uh, luckily there's an easy way to fix this. So if we just go to our entity command buffer type, we just do a dot parallel writer. So now um, when we actually come up here to schedule it, we do an ECB singleton create command buffer state dot world unmanaged. That's all the same but then we just have to do a dot as parallel writer. Now that's all good, well and good for scheduling it, but you see that we do have a little bit of an issue when it comes to removing the component here. If I can get this to show here, uh, you'll see that it actually is asking for a sort key before we pass in the entity. The reason that it needs a sort key is basically because when the entity command buffer runs in parallel, it doesn't necessarily know which order to play these back in because these are going to be scheduling across many worker threads. It doesn't know, you know, which, you know, kind of order to play them back in. So what we can do is go up to the parameters of the execute method and we can get an int sort key like this. And then here we can just pass in the sort key here. However, this isn't going to entirely work. We do need to make sure that this sort key, this is actually a special type of sort key. So we do have to actually add an attribute before this. So just by using the square brackets, we can do um, entity in query index. And so this is basically going to be um, kind of give each entity in the query a unique identifier and it's going to assign it to this sort key. So now that when it actually plays, it knows kind of which order to play them back in. So we will go ahead and enter play mode here and you'll see that the zombie is going to rise up from the ground and it's going to stop. And now if we go over to our systems and we search for our zombie rise system, you see that the entity count is only at two and three and it's just basically going back and forth between two and three because there's only you know two or three entities at a time that are actually rising up out of the ground. And so that is exactly what we want to see. So now we have these zombies rising up out of the ground. They're also already uh, facing at the brain. So the next thing that we're going to want to have them do is just go ahead and have them walk forward right towards the brain. Um, but while they're walking forward, we're gonna go ahead and have them play a little bit of an animation where they kind of you know sway back and forth. So uh, just kind of give them a little bit more pizzazz. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and create a couple more data components. You'll see that one is the zombie walk properties. This just has a couple public floats on it. One for walk speed, obviously to tell how fast we want the uh, zombie to walk. And then basically to control our you know air quotes animation, I have a walk amplitude and walk frequency basically just to control you know how far it's going to sway side to side and how frequently it's going to do that and then because we're basically going to be using a sine wave to control it swaying back and forth we do just need to have a timer on each of these zombies this timer is basically just going to be continually incrementing up throughout the duration of the game and then basically using this we can kind of calculate where it should be in the sine wave so it can you know kind of sway back and forth nice and smoothly and actually one more data component that we'll need is this zombie heading which just has a public float for the value this is just going to keep track of the angle that it should be facing um, to face the brain here and this is kind of an important one because as we're doing the kind of walking and eating animation we just need to keep track of you know which general direction it should be facing to um, you know kind of animate it around that so then we'll just come over to our zombie mono behavior add a couple more public fields for the walk speed, walk amplitude, and walk frequency. Of course, just going to go ahead and set those in our zombie walk properties as you would expect. And then also just go ahead and add the components for the zombie timer and zombie heading. That sounded like zombie beheading. So here we can just come back to Unity and set a walk speed of 0.5, a walk amplitude of 0.2, and a walk frequency of 1. So now we'll create our zombie walk aspect. You see that I basically just populated it with a transform. Uh, we do have a ref RW for the zombie timer. Again, because we're, we're going to be incrementing that zombie timer as it's walking along. And then we're just going to need read-only access to the walk properties and the heading. Now I've just created these private properties um, just to easily access all those values there. And then below our private walk timer property, we'll just go ahead and create a public void called walk. 
which does take in a float for delta time. So first thing that we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and do is just increment the walk timer by delta time. We can also just move it forward just by doing a transform.position plus equals transform.forward. So this is basically um, gives us a float three for the, the forward facing direction of our zombie. And we could just multiply this by our walk speed multiplied by delta time. So now of course we just need to call this from a system. So here I've just gone ahead and created the zombie walk system. And then below it, I've just gone ahead and created Created the iJob entity for the zombie walk job. You see, it's super simple right now. It just takes in a public float for delta time. And then in the execute method, we're looking for the zombie walk aspect, which we've just called zombie. And then we can just do zombie.walk passing in delta time. And then of course, inside the on update, we're just gonna wanna go ahead and schedule that. So we'll do a new zombie walk job. Of course, we gotta set delta time. And then we can just go ahead and do a dot schedule parallel. Again, this is going to be happening on a fairly large number of zombies, so we want to schedule that parallel. So go ahead and enter play mode, and we're also getting all kinds of invalid operation exception errors. Um, so again, I think if we kind of take a look at what's going on here, we'll see that the zombie walk system is happening before the zombie spawn system. So let's actually make the zombie walk system happen after the zombie rise system, just so it's kind of um, in a little bit of an order here. So we'll say update after type of zombie rise system. Okay, so we will go ahead and enter play mode and you'll see the zombie is rising, although it's already moving forward you know, as it was coming out of the ground. So I'll see if I restart, you'll see that the zombie is kind of going forward as it's rising up out of the ground. We don't exactly want that to happen. Now, the reason that that's happening is because both the rise and walk systems are running on the zombies at the same time. So again, we can kind of do something like we did before where we kind of, you know, add and remove components. However, that's not necessarily exactly what we want because you know we've already set the values for the you know walk properties inside our inspector, and we want to preserve all that. We don't necessarily want to um, you know remove the component you know during the rise system and then you know somehow re-add it back with it remembering all those values. So we can do something cool, which again is another new feature as part of Entities 1.0, where we can make these components enableable. So we'll just go ahead and do a comma after the I component data, and then we'll make this an I enableable component. So that basically means that this component can be disabled. And when we disable this component, any systems or any aspects that have this data component, it's not actually going to run that system against that particular entity because that component is disabled. Now, again, these are an awesome feature and I do want to go much more in depth into these soon, but basically the gist of it is, you know, at the beginning of the game, game, we're going to disable this component, it's going to keep all those values, it's going to preserve them. And then once that zombie has risen up out of the ground, we'll go ahead and re enable that component. So then it can go ahead and walk forward. So now unfortunately, as of right now, there isn't a way that we can say, you know, inside of a baker, just go ahead and automatically tell a component to be disabled. So we're gonna have to kind of make our own custom little system here. Now what we're going to want to go ahead and do is create what is known as a tag component. So we'll just go ahead and do a public struct. And we can call this a uh, new zombie tag, just I component data. And you'll see that this is just an empty I component data. So there's no actual like data inside this data component. This tag component basically just allows us to find anything that has this tag component on it. And then we can perform some certain operations on it. I did a whole video on tag components. Feel free to go check that out if you wanna learn about, more about how they're useful. Then we just need to remember to go to our zombie baker and add that new zombie tag component so it spawns with the new zombie tag. So I'm gonna create another I system here. This time we're gonna do something different than an I job entity. We're gonna use the new idiomatic for each. Um, but anyways, before I get into that, I just do just want to make sure that we're going to do in here an update in group type of initialization system group. So this is basically going to run in that initial initialization system. So now inside the on update, we're actually going to be running the logic inside the uh, on update here. So we just go ahead and type in for each just like we do a kind of regular for each here. Now for the collection type in 
instead of doing, you know, like a for each through a, a list or something like that, we can actually use the system API to do an entity query. And then so we're going to query for anything with the zombie walk aspect. And then here we'll just go ahead and call this variable zombie. So now basically this is going to iterate through anything that has this zombie walk aspect. So of course we could just do a, you know, zombie dot entity or a say a zombie dot walk if we wanted to, we basically just have access to this zombie walk aspect. Now we actually want to filter this out even further. We want to have things that only have that uh, new zombie tag. Basically this is an initialization system that only runs once on new zombies. So after this query zombie walk aspect, we can actually just do a dot with all and then inside the type brackets we can type in that new zombie tag so this is going to basically further filter out our, our entity query and then again any of those zombie walk aspects are going to be returned to this here again this new idiomatic for each is really great and i do want to do a full deep dive onto this later but this is basically just kind of the gist of you know how to get some working knowledge of how to set this up here so i'm going to do a couple things so first i'm just going to go ahead and remove that new zombie tag because again we only want this to run once against new zombies and then after that we're just going to go ahead and set the walk component as disabled to begin with. Now we can do this using an entity command buffer. So we'll just do a var ecb. I'll just go ahead and create a local entity command buffer here because realistically this is only going to be running once on the newest spawn zombie as soon as it spawns. So what we can do here again we can do an ecb dot remove component the new zombie tag and want to remove that off of the zombie dot entity and then to disable the component we just do an ecb dot set component enabled and here we're going to do the type of zombie walk properties again this is going to be on the zombie dot entity and we're going to set this to false so that basically means that the zombie walk properties are disabled and then finally we just need to do an ecb dot playback and then we can do a state dot entity manager inside there so it plays back with an entity manager so now you'll see that when we go ahead and enter play mode you see that the zombie will rise up from the grave and then however it's not actually going to start walking because we still just need to go ahead and re-enable that walk component so we can just go ahead and do that in the zombie rise system here so after we go ahead and set the zombie at ground level and remove that rise rate component we can just do an ecb dot set component enabled again these are the zombie walk properties so we do have to pass in the sort key next we need the zombie dot entity and then finally we'll pass in true because we want to enable that component Component. So now we'll enter play mode. You'll see the zombie rises up out of the ground. Once it has risen, it's just going to go ahead and begin to move forward. Now, again, it's just moving kind of, you know, forward, kind of dull right now, which is, you know, kind of cool. Still looks like a cool little zombie guy moving forward. Uh, a couple of problems. For one, it's just going immediately through the brain. And uh, number two, it's not actually like swaying back and forth like we want it to. So first thing we'll do is get it to actually sway back and forth because that's kind of a fun little trick here. Um, now to do this, we're actually gonna go all the way back to the spawn zombie system so we can actually set that heading properly here. I just had to add this public float three property position which goes to the transform aspect dot position on the graveyard aspect. So in the spawn zombie job, just kind of at the end of this execute method here, going to go ahead and calculate the zombie heading again just using that math helpers dot get heading passing in the position of the new zombie as well as the graveyard dot position i did end up having to add in a uh, public float three property so i can get this position nice and easily but then after that we just do an entity command buffer dot set component on the new zombie passing in that new zombie heading value is equal to zombie heading so i'll just come back to the zombie walk aspect We'll just go ahead and uh, go into this walk function here, and then we'll calculate this sway angle by doing a walk amplitude multiplied by math.sign, passing in our walk frequency multiplied by our walk timer. From there, we can actually set the transform.rotation equal to a quaternion.euler, passing in zero for the X, our heading for the Y, again, because we want that to continually face basically towards the brain and then passing in the sway angle in the Z. So it basically just kind of rocks back and forth just like that. Okay, so boom, enter play mode. You'll see that we have this zombie rise and then now when it walks, 
you see that it sways back and forth just like that, which is really, really cool to see. <laughs> I love it, just that like slow walk back and forth. All right, now the next thing that we need to fix is we actually need to get it to stop before the brain here. Um, and then once it stops at the brain, then we're actually gonna go have it uh, go ahead and start eating on that brain. So again, back on the zombie walk aspect, I'll just go ahead and create a public bool for is in stopping range. This is going to take in a float three for the brain position, as well as a float for the brain radius squared. And then we're just gonna do a math.distance squared comparing the uh, brain position to the transform.position of the actual zombie. And if that is less than or equal to brain radius squared, that means that we are within the stopping range. So now to actually implement this, we'll come back to the uh, zombie walk job here. And we can say if zombie dot is in stopping range and we'll need to get the brains position. I'm just gonna cheat a little bit and do a float 3.0. And then we can do a uh, another public float here for the brain radius squared. So now if we're within the stopping range, we can use our entity command buffer to basically disable that zombie walk properties component. Again, we are going to be using a parallel writer here, so we do have to pass in the sort key, of course the entity that we want to um, operate across, and then passing in false. And then so now we just need to remember to actually set these values here. For now, I'm just gonna go ahead and cheat and just manually put this in. We will actually be getting the um, actual radius of the brain a little bit later on because that's going to change when we're eating the brain and it starts to shrink down. And then lastly, we just need the entity command buffer. So of course we need to get the uh, ECB singleton. I'm just gonna use the end simulation entity command buffer dot singleton. So we'll go ahead and set ECB equal to ECB singleton dot create command buffer as parallel writer. And we do need to pass in the state dot world unmanaged there. We will go ahead and enter play mode here. You'll see that this zombie is going to start uh, walking up towards the brain. And then if all goes well, it should stop just a little bit outside of that brain's radius there. So, boom, and there it is, it is stopped. Uh, we basically disabled that walking um, properties component. And then again, you know, any other zombies who are closing in on the brain here should also stop basically just right around that same radius there. So that is wonderful. So let me go ahead and fix my cheat a little bit and then we'll go ahead and actually calculate the proper radius of the brain here. So in order to identify the brain, I've just gone ahead and created a brain tag. Again, this is just an empty data component so we can easily find this brain. And then I've just gone ahead and created a brain mono. Uh, the mono behavior doesn't actually have any public values in it right now because all we need to do is just create this little baker that adds the brain tag. So now we'll go ahead and select the brain and the sub scene here and go ahead and add the brain mono again doesn't have any values in it but if we go ahead and enter play mode we can select the brain see that it does have the brain tag inside of its components here so that is wonderful so in order to get the scale we're going to go ahead and grab a reference to that entity and then once we have that entity we're just going to go ahead and pull the scale component from it so a couple steps involved with that so we can just go ahead and do a var brain entity is equal to system api dot get singleton entity, uh, passing in the type of brain tag. So again, we're gonna find that entity with the brain tag and just return it to this local brain entity variable. So once we have that brain entity, let's just go ahead and get the brain scale. In order to get the actual value of that brain scale, the way we're gonna go ahead and do that is again using the system.api. We can do a get component. The component that we're gonna look up is the local to world transform make sure we're not doing the you know local to parent transform or anything like that inside here we want to pass in the brain entity after that we can just do a dot value and dot scale so that basically gives us the scale value and then to actually calculate the brain radius we can do a uh, var brain radius is equal to brain scale multiplied by five because um, when the brain is basically at a scale of one, it still has a radius of five. And then we're just gonna go ahead and add in a value of 0.5 uh, just to give it a little bit of extra room here. So now we can just do uh, brain radius squared is equal to brain radius multiplied by brain radius. And then coming back to Unity, you'll see that the zombie does stop at pretty much the same spot that it was before. Okay, so next up, we wanna get these zombies to actually go ahead and start eating on the brain. And so again, we're gonna play some stupid little animation where it basically just uses a sine wave and then just continually attacks 
hacks the brain back and forth like that. So I'll just come back to the script here where we have these zombie walk properties and we're gonna go ahead and create a zombie eat properties. Again, this is gonna be an I component data. We want it to be an enableable component and we do have public float variables for eat damage per second, eat amplitude and eat frequency. Um, again, this damage per second, we're actually going to be applying damage to the brain brain damage and then um, also we're going to have the amplitude and frequency so it kind of goes you know, back and forth as we want it to so then we'll just come back to our zombie mono behavior here add some fields for eat damage amplitude and frequency and then go ahead and add those to the zombie eat properties and so we'll come over to our zombie prefab let's set an eat damage per second of one eat amplitude of 0.2 and an eat frequency of 10. And the next thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is just come back to this initialize zombie system. And then we're just going to go ahead and do a set component enabled on the zombie eat properties to set that to false so it is disabled. So then we'll come back to the zombie walk system. And then again, we'll say if the zombie is within the stopping range, not only are we going to disable the zombie walk components, We'll actually go ahead and do an ecb dot set component enabled on the zombie eat properties. Of course, passing in the sort key and the zombie dot entity, and we'll set this one equal to true because once it basically has reached the brain, then it's going to start eating it. Okay, so next up, we're just going to create the final zombie aspect, which is going to be the zombie eat aspect. Of course, we do have just the public entity reference here. Um, we're also going to be modifying the transform, so we do have the transform aspect here. Again, we have read and write access to the zombie timer, um, just so we can kind of you know increment that as we go. And then we do have a read-only access to the zombie eat properties as well as the zombie heading. And then I've just gone ahead and created a few properties um, so we can kind of access and modify the things that we need here. Then below that, let's just go ahead and create a public void called eat, which takes in a float for the delta time. Again, we're just gonna increment the zombie timer by delta time. And then next we just go ahead and calculate the eat angle. We'll set this equal to eat amplitude multiplied by math.sign passing in the eat frequency multiplied by zombie timer. Again, just so we can kind of uh, calculate that angle. Then we'll go ahead and set the uh, rotation. This time we're doing a quaternion.euler. We're setting the rotation on the x-axis for the eat angle so it kind of goes forward and back rather than side to side. And again, we're just keeping the heading in the y direction so it stays facing towards the brain. So now we'll go ahead and create the zombie eat system, which is going to update after the zombie walk system. Again, just so we have you know all the dependencies set properly. So then below the system, I've just gone ahead and created this zombie eat job. Of course, we just have a public float for delta time. Inside the execute, we're just gonna go ahead and um, look at the zombie eat aspect, just called zombie. And we can just do a zombie.eat, passing in delta time. Um, again, we're just gonna go ahead and schedule this here. Just gonna go ahead and do a schedule parallel, of course, passing in the delta time there. Now, again, this should only run once we actually reach that brain when the eat properties component gets re-enabled on the entity. So if we look at the zombie here, it's just gonna go ahead and start walking. It's going you know side to side, kind of as normal as we'd expect here. And then once it reaches the brain and then it should start going into its you know crazy eat mode here. So <laughs> there we go. It is now eating the brain. So we'll wait for a couple more zombies to come join in on the, uh, the feast as it were. So yeah, this is, this is really great. We got the, you know, the zombies feast in a way on the brain. And then uh, now the next kind of portion of this is to actually apply some damage to the brain, brain damage as it were, um, to actually start making the brain shrink down as the zombies continue to chomp away at that big old brain. Okay, so basically the way that we're gonna get this to work as the zombies are eating at this brain, we're going to apply damage to this brain. Now the brain is basically gonna start with kind of a, a basic health value. And then as that health value decreases, we're gonna start scaling down the brain uh, by the factor of however much that health has been decreased by. So in order to keep track of this, I've just gone ahead and created a new data component called brain health, which has public float values for the current value and then the maximum value. And basically we just do a simple division operation to divide value by max to get basically the scale factor of how large the brain should be at any given time. Time. Let's come back to our brain mono behavior and we can set a public float value for the brain health. And then we're just going to go ahead and add a component, which is going to be a new brain health, where we'll set value equal to authoring.brainhealth 
and the max equal to authoring dot brain health as well. So we'll just go ahead and set the brain health to a value of 100 for now. We can go ahead and increase that, but we just want to set it to that value um, just kind of for testing purposes for now. So now we need to figure out how to actually decrement this brain health as these zombies are eating away at the brain. Now, one approach that you may expect is just to take the brain health and just decrement it by some amount as the zombie is eating away at that. Well, that's going to end up being a little bit of a problem because you'll remember that we're going to have many of these zombies all eating away at the brain at one single time. Now, again, we're going to be scheduling this work across multiple worker threads, so it's really going to be impossible for us to actually write to that brain health data component. We can't just, you know, easily decrement it because, you know, multiple threads could be decrementing that data, um, and we're just going to end up getting inaccurate results. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use something as a dynamic buffer. Now, this dynamic buffer is basically going to store all the, you know, damage happening to the brain every single frame, and we're basically going to, you know, add that all up into a buffer and then at the end of the frame we're just going to iterate through all the elements on that buffer basically add up all those values and then decrement that value from the overall brain health so here we're going to create something that is another type of data component which is basically going to be an i buffer element data now this is basically how we can kind of create the basics of a dynamic buffer. I've also done another extensive video on a dynamic buffer, so feel free to check that out if you want a little bit more information. But basically it's another way that we can add array-like data to a particular entity. So we can come back to our brain baker here and similar to how we do an add component, we can do an add buffer. And then here we type in the type of buffer element. So in this case, it's the brain damage buffer element. So now you'll see here when we enter play mode, we can go ahead and select this brain here. And then you'll see that we do have this brain damage buffer element. Right now it has zero elements. So if we actually expand this, we don't have um, any elements here. Um, although it does allow us to actually add some elements here, we can say, you know, set a value of 10 or something like that in here. Um, again, it's not really doing anything at this point. You'll see that our brain health, um, the value is still set to 100 and the max is 100 as well. So now we're gonna go ahead and do kind of the initial part of this where we're basically adding to this brain damage buffer inside of our eat function here, just inside of our zombie eat aspect. So what we'll do is first just go ahead and calculate the eat damage, which is just equal to eat damage per second multiplied by delta time. Of course, we're just gonna normalize out by frame rates. So here we'll just go ahead and create a variable and we'll call it uh, cur brain damage, set this equal to a new brain damage buffer element. And for the value, we'll set this equal to our eat damage. And then what we want to do is basically append this to the existing dynamic buffer on the um, brain entity. Now we can do this using an entity command buffer. So we'll need a couple of things to reference here. So uh, we will need to pull in a few more things into this eat method here. So we will need an entity command buffer. Make sure we're doing a parallel writer because again, we're scheduling this parallel. We can call this uh, ECB. Of course, we will need an integer sort key. And then finally, we will need a reference to the uh, brain entity. So then once we have all that, we can do an ECB dot append to buffer inside here we'll pass in the sort key the entity which is the brain entity and then lastly the cur brain damage so this basically is going to create a new dynamic buffer element and then this append to buffer is going to basically add that new element to that existing dynamic buffer so now we just need to come back to the zombie eat system and go ahead and add a few more things here so we will need a public entity command buffer parallel writer ECB public entity for the brain entity here. Of course, in the execute method, we'll need to do an entity in query index for the int sort key. And so we can go ahead and pass in our entity command buffer, our sort key, and our brain entity. Now, when we schedule this, of course, we'll just need to get the uh, var ECB singleton, set this equal to system API dot get singleton. We'll do this in the end simulation entity command buffer system dot singleton of course we can get 
the brain entity as well by doing a system API dot get singleton entity using the existing brain tag. And then when we schedule the job, go ahead and set ECB equal to ECB singleton, create command buffer, state world unmanaged dot as parallel writer, and the brain entity is equal to brain entity. So now let's enter play mode and take a look at what is happening. I'm just gonna go ahead and pause it real quick so we can kind of uh, look at some things as they're happening here. Okay, so you see that we have, again, the buffer has zero elements in it and the brain health is still at 100, 100. So we'll go ahead and enter play mode here and we'll go ahead and wait for this zombie to get up close to the brain. And once it's gonna start eating the brain, you're gonna see something that's gonna happen here. So you see that immediately this uh, buffer spikes up and we're adding basically one element every single frame. So this is, you know, we're already up to 400 elements of this buffer here. Let's just go ahead and pause that. And that's again, just with one single zombie uh, eating away at that brain here. And you can see if we're looking at all these elements, basically, you know, each of these elements is gonna equal to what the delta time was that frame, because again, we're just, you know, multiplying essentially one times our delta time here to basically calculate how much damage should be applied per frame. Now, again, we're not actually applying the damage at this point. You'll see that the brain health is still at 100, 100. So basically now the next step is, uh, you know, after we append something to the buffer, let's just go ahead and add up everything inside this buffer and subtract it from the brain health. Okay, so I've just gone ahead and created the basics of a brain aspect here. You'll see that, of course, we have, you know, the entity reference, transform aspect, as you would expect. Um, we also do have a ref RW to the brain health because we're going to be, you know, writing to that brain health component. And then we also do have a dynamic buffer type of brain damage buffer element, um, which we've just called the brain damage buffer here. Now let's go ahead and create a public void called damage brain. So I'll just go ahead and do a for each brain damage buffer element in the brain damage buffer. And here we can just do a brain health dot value dot RW dot value minus equals brain damage buffer element dot value. So again, this is just gonna loop through everything in that uh, current brain damage buffer and decrement it by that particular value that it's calculated. Now, important thing that we need to do is just go ahead and do a brain damage buffer dot clear. And that's basically just going to clear out the buffer every single frame. So basically we're only you know taking into account the damage happening every frame. Okay, so now we actually need to go ahead and schedule this work in a system. Okay, so I've just gone ahead and created this apply brain damage system to actually apply the brain damage. Now uh, we're gonna go ahead and do an update in group type of simulation system group. And here we're gonna set order last equal to true. Now there's a specific reason for that and that's so we get it to update after this type of end simulation entity command buffer system. Now we want this to update after the end simulation entity command buffer system because if you'll remember, when we do our zombie eat system, we're basically you know appending to that damage buffer inside the end simulation entity command buffer system. So if we basically update our system after the end simulation entity command buffer system had played back those operations to basically add to that buffer, now we can actually go ahead and go through and apply the damage as needed. And you see that all I'm doing here is we just do a for each brain in system API dot query dot brain aspect uh, brain dot damage brain. So super simple here. Again, you know, we're, we are doing a for each even though it is iterating across one single brain. Okay, so let's go ahead and enter play mode here. So let's go ahead and watch. You'll see once the zombie reaches there, now we see a couple interesting things happen. You'll see the brain health that immediately starts decrementing. However, the brain damage buffer element, this is still set to a value of zero. Um, that's basically just a little bit of a quirk about you know when the inspector updates its view versus when we're actually clearing out the the uh, dynamic buffer and all that so um, basically we're clearing out before it gets updated so we can't actually see the values inside the damage buffer but basically they're being added in and then cleared out and i see once we have a bunch of zombies you know all of a sudden at our brain um, this value is going to start going down very very quickly until it reaches zero and then it's just going to continue past zero because we don't have any other logic in place right now. So now let's actually get the brain to shrink as the health goes down. So that's basically just going to happen inside of our damage brain function here. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is get a reference to the local to world. So we can just do a var ltw is equal to transform dot local to world. Now this local to world is basically comprised of the translation rotation and scale components here. So on here we can set ltw dot scale 
is equal to the brain health dot read only dot value divided by brain health dot value read only dot max. So that basically um, kind of gives us a scalar to determine kind of where it's at on the overall brain health. And then we just need to go ahead and set the transform dot local to world back to that LTW there. And so actually I'm realizing that we are getting a bunch of invalid operation exceptions. Um, this time it's saying the previously scheduled job transform matrix local to world yada yada reads from uh, the transforms local to world transform. Uh, you must call job handle dot complete on the job uh, before you can write to the component handle safely. Basically what this means is that um, there is a system inside the transform system group. This is kind of a built in unity thing here. Um, that's all also going to be writing to that local to world component, which hasn't necessarily completed before we are running this because this for each function runs on the main thread. Uh, basically, all that we need to do to resolve it in this case uh, is not necessarily the best thing to do, but we can just go ahead and do a state dot dependency dot complete. That's going to go ahead and force any jobs that um, you know this system needs to have completed before I'm um, actually running this for each function here. Now, that isn't all too bad because basically we are going to be running that system kind of towards the end of that simulation system group where there is already going to be a sync point anyhow. So we see that we do no longer have any errors. Uh, now let's take a look at um, you know what's going on here. Once the zombie starts attacking this brain, we should see that the brain begins to shrink. So we see that the brain is starting to shrink a little bit now, you know, just as that zombie is chomping away at it. It's going to start going a little bit faster once we have multiple zombies start attacking the brain here. And you see that there is kind of a little bit of a of a kind of a bug happening right here where basically you know this first zombie it, it got to the brain when it was at full size and it's just they're basically just staying in their position continuing to eat down the brain um, all the way it's until nothing although the new zombies they'll kind of you know get to the get to the point where the brain is uh, before continuing to eat it if that makes any if i'm making any sense whatsoever right now <laughs> and then it starts growing back up that's awesome that's not exactly what we wanted but um, it is kind of funny and again now we can eat the brain backwards. So it's um, just gonna take over this entire graveyard here. So a couple last things that we need to work out before we can kind of, you know, call it quits on this. So the first thing that we're gonna fix is that kind of little glitch where the zombie is kind of a little bit away from the brain where it's eating it. So basically what's gonna happen is it's gonna kind of eat away at the brain. Once the brain shrinks to a sufficient level, then it's actually gonna go ahead and go back into the walk state. It's gonna take a couple steps forward until it walks back up to the brain and then gonna continue eating on the brain. So we'll come back to the zombie eat aspect, just add in a quick, simple little uh, public bool for is in eating range, which takes in the brain position and brain radius squared and just returns this little math function where we do a distance squared between the brain's position and the zombie's position. If that's less than or equal to the brain radius squared minus one, go ahead and return true that we are within the eating range. So basically the eating range is going to be a one unit window there. So now let's go to the zombie eat job and we're gonna change things up a little bit. So we're gonna say if zombie dot is in eating range, again, we can just cheat a little bit and do a float 3.0 because we know the brain is at the center. We will need to calculate the brain radius squared here again. But so yeah, basically we say if we are within that range, go ahead and eat. Otherwise, if we are not within the eating range, then we're going to go ahead and disable the eating properties and then re-enable the walk properties. Now again, this is a really nice feature of these enableable components because these components can, you know, kind of stay on these entities and we can easily just disable or re-enable them to basically add or remove functionality. So then we'll just go ahead and calculate the brain radius, kind of similar to how we did before. So we'll get the uh, brain scale by um, doing a get component local to world transform off the brain entity, getting the value dot scale, and then calculating our brain radius by doing our brain scale multiplied by five. And I'm gonna go ahead and add in a value of one just to make the brain radius for the system a little bit larger. And then again, at brain radius squared is just calculated by doing brain radius multiplied by brain radius. So now this should basically just work as expected. Again, the, um, you know, walk system is going to kind of continue to work as expected. So basically when we stop eating, we're just going to enter, re-enter that walk system and we're going to start, you know, walking again, basically until we've gotten close enough to the brain where we can start eating it again. So see, we're going to start eating away at the entity here. And then once it gets about one unit in distance away, we're going to walk 
take we're gonna yeah take a couple more steps to it start eating away start eating away start eating away again maybe take a couple more steps to it in just a sec here and yeah that's exactly what we want to what we want we want to be you know nice and close to the brain as we're eating away at it so we can get all those uh you know brain nutrients <laughs> So then now we see here that the brain is going to go, you know, all the way down to zero. And then I'm not sure we'll probably, you know, continue, <laughs> probably continue eating it to make it uh, bigger and bigger here again. We'll see what happens here. Okay. And just like that, I think we fixed the other bug that we're having. So basically the brain is now uh, down to zero and we're no longer eating it. And um, yeah, the zombies just kind of continue walking off in the direction that um, they were facing. So now the simulation is basically just about complete. I think the last thing that I wanted to showcase is do just a little bit of basic camera control. And I'm not going to go too into detail on this. There's going to be a couple things that we're doing a little bit differently. So it's kind of important that you, um, you know, have a little bit of exposure to these concepts. Of course, I'll be going much more into detail on, you know, how to do these things later on. But I do just want to show you, you know, how we can kind of bridge the gap a little bit between things on the entities world and things on the mono behavior world uh, because of course the main camera here this has to be a mono behavior we can't have it as an entity right now um, and yeah we do want it to uh, you know have a little bit of an effect where we can actually have it kind of you know circle around this graveyard and then as the brain gets smaller and smaller we'll go ahead and actually have that camera you know rise up and get a little bit closer in okay so i've just gone ahead and created a camera singleton here you'll see that it's just a regular tried and true mono behavior where we have a public static camera singleton called instance we do have a couple serialized fields here for the start radius, end radius, start height, end height, and speed. We have a you know couple public methods here, so we can basically pass in the scale of the brain, and this is basically just going to return um, the you know radius and height at any given time. Uh, the speed is just going to stay constant because it gets a little wonky if we start messing with that too much. And then in awake, we just go ahead and set the uh, singleton instance here. Okay, so now I'm going to create a camera controller system. Now this one's going to be a little bit different. This one's going to be a system base rather than an I system. If you've been you know following the channel for a little while now, you're probably very familiar with these system bases. The reason that we're using a system base here is because we are going to be interfacing with managed components, which um, you know is something that we cannot do in I systems. Now again, these system bases, these are uh, public partial classes, not structs, and these are not uh, compatible with the burst compiler. So these system bases are still perfectly fine to use, although um, in general, it's preferred that we use the iSystem interface. So anyways, you'll see that we have a protected override void on update. It doesn't force us to use the, you know, on create or on start running or on destroy or anything like that. The only thing that we need for these system bases to work is the on update. So first we're going to go ahead and get a reference to the brain scale. Again, we can do that by getting the brain entity. Again, we do have access to the system API. So once we have the current brain scale, let's go ahead and get the camera singleton. Go ahead and do a quick null check there. So now we'll just go ahead and calculate a position factor, which is equal to system api.time.elapsed time. So this is basically how long the simulation has been running for, multiplied by camera singleton dot speed. So this is basically you know where it should be in terms of um, you know how we're circling around the map here. Go ahead and calculate the height by doing a camera singleton dot height at scale passing in the brain scale here also going to do the same thing with the radius so now we can set the camera singletons transform dot position again this is all just regular unity mono behavior stuff at this point equal to a new vector three again we can use a vector three not a float three here should do just want to make sure that this uh, position factor is of type float and here we can set x equal to math f dot cosine of the position factor multiplied by radius y is going to equal the height and then for the z we can do math f dot sine passing in the position factor multiplied by the radius and then lastly we can just do a camera singleton dot transform dot look at passing in a vector 3.0 and a vector 3.0. Let's go to the camera, add the camera singleton, do a start radius of 20, end radius of 5, start height of 2, end height of 10, 
and a speed of 0.1. And then go ahead and enter play mode, and we should now see the camera start to rotate around the uh, graveyard just like this. Go ahead and uh, take a close look at this zombie here once it starts eating away at the brain. Um, we should start to notice that the camera is going to get in a little bit closer to the brain and it's going to start rising up. I mean, it's doing it fairly quickly just because we have the uh, you know brain health only set to a value of 100 right now. But um, yeah, let's just go ahead and take a moment to just you know admire our work. You know, this nice starry night in this creepy little graveyard with these crazy little zombie guys um, just going after it. We can go ahead and you'll see that now the camera is a little bit high off the ground now. The uh, movement isn't exactly all that smooth just because um, you know the, the brain health goes down quite quickly and then the you know guys stop eating the, the brain so um, it's a, a little bit jittery in that sense there. Um, but yeah we'll just watch it go ahead and go down to zero. And there's you know kind of a little glitchy glitchy at the end but you know it's a funny little game here and to kind of smooth things out i usually just go to the brain and set this to a value of 1000 um, let's just go ahead and maximize this for kind of our last little play here as we just go ahead and admire this right here i think in my um previous timings on this it takes about 90 seconds for this simulation to play out at a value of 1000 here um, but yeah i hope you all have enjoyed this video so far um Definitely let me know if there's anything that had been kind of confusing in here. I'm sure in a number of places I was probably going a little bit too fast just to kind of, you know, again, give you a working knowledge of things. I really just want to get you all familiar with the concepts and the APIs. Um, I think this should be a pretty good jumping in point, again, just to get you familiar with most of the things. And then we can start going more into depth on a lot of these things that we we're kind of talking about today. I know there are so many new exciting features um, available to us in Entities 1.0. Really, really looking forward to um, you know making all sorts of more fun projects like this one to kind of showcase how to use all these different things and you know really get into detail about some of the quirks and things that you need to watch out for uh, because there are definitely a lot of things that you need to watch out for because you can really um, kind of uh, end up shooting yourself in the foot if you're not being careful. I'm sure you probably have noticed that a few times as we're kind of going through and we kind of ran into some error messages along the way and everything like that. Anyways, um, I'm probably just going to go ahead and wrap this video up here because I have just been filming for, let me see how long now, um, nearly six hours straight here. Well, not straight. I mean, I took a couple little breaks here and there, but um, have, it's about six hours of recorded footage to go through. Going to be editing that over um, the next week here and get this up for you ASAP. After that, going to be heading out to Unite. Um, so yeah, very exciting times right now. Lots of cool things going on. Um, yeah, once again, if you did enjoy today's video and you found it helpful, I'd really, really appreciate it if you share it out with some people who might find it valuable as well and may find it interesting. Anyways, you know, feel free if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments section below or join us over on Discord. You can get to it at tmg.dev discord. Anyways, with that, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.